that's an edit that has been noted. Mr. Nakajima. I move the approval of the minutes of May 21st, 2019, as amended. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, any further comments, edits, questions? All those in favor? Okay, so we have a motion to amend and um, approve the minutes as uh, discussed tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, committee announcements. Mr. Demling. Just wanted to give a brief shout out of support to Springfield, the NAACP, and many other advocates uh, across the state who this week filed lawsuit against the state, charging that the education funding formula is unconstitutional, violating civil rights. Uh, it's pretty much based around income inequality and that um, students in low-income uh, cities and towns uh, pay the price. Uh, so as the state endlessly dithers about solutions, as they are doing again this year, it's really nice to see uh, this kind of uh, action being taken, and um, I wish them all the best. Thank you, Mr. Demley. Any other announcements from the committee? Okay, seeing none, with that, we will open public comment. If anyone from the public would like to uh, make a comment, please do so. You can come to the front over here. These mics, uh, you have to press the button, make sure the bright green light is on. And just state your name and you have three minutes. Okay, seeing no public comments for tonight, I will close public comments. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's update. So Dr. Morris. I'll be brief. Uh, one thing not on the update that no doubt you all have heard is that the school year ended on Friday, uh, which was a, one of our earliest start dates. So very excited students, uh, hopefully very excited parents who work on childcare for a week they weren't expecting perhaps, but um, we really wanna thank our staff and students and families for a wonderful end of school year. There were sort of too many end of school year events to list specifically, so I just picked a couple um, that somebody, many of you were able to be at the high school graduation, which was wonderful, and I think what's notable to share at the Amherst Elementary level is that each of the elementary schools sends a, a representative uh, to sit on stage and be acknowledged, and what was so nice is seeing seniors walk across the stage and see their, in some cases, kindergarten teacher or school nurse run over, give a hug, and then follow along on the other handshake line and just that our graduates really do recognize the impact of their elementary school education uh, that got them part of the way there um, to walk across the stage at the Mullen Center. Um, I'd also like to recognize, you know, these are two of my favorite events of the year, the employee recognition event we had uh, about eight days ago. Uh, it's an opportunity to recognize both retirees, and we'll talk about one of those later actually uh, as it relates to the gifts but also to recognize uh, staff members in any domain who have worked the district for 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and we actually had a 40-year employee recognition, a 40-year employee recognized. Uh, and it's just a wonderful event. Uh, employees bring their families, and it's also a reminder of the talented, wonderful staff we have and uh, how, how much more often we can try to acknowledge their great work, that it's, uh, it's a wonderful job. No one goes into teaching for the acknowledgement or the, the praise, and yet it doesn't hurt, right, mm -hmm. um, to, to recognize the great work our educators do. Absolutely. And lastly, I just want to thank Ms. McDonald and Ms. Cunningham, uh, who put together, which is on the back, an update on the work of the uh, middle school grade span advisory board. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but that also went out on the last newsletter, and one of their they're, they're in a subcommittee on communication as it relates to that. So we have, we have multiple groups fo focused on different areas, but the kind of the, the general consensus of the larger group was that there actually needed to be a subgroup specifically focused on making sure that the meetings, the content gets communicated out. And I think they did a smashing job on the first one. So thank you. Great. Any questions or comments for the superintendent? Okay, thank you, Dr. Morris. I just want to add, uh, I didn't get a chance to attend any of the elementary school graduations um, and moving on ceremonies last week, but I did attend, uh, just because my sons happened to be there at the Fort River uh, sort of last day festivities. And I, it's just really incredible to see um, the incredible amount of work and love and support that our educators put into the school year, of course, but you see it kind of all come together on the very last week and last days of school. 
um, because the kids just are so excited to be finished with the school year, um, but also celebrating everything that they've done during the course of the year. And so at Fort River, um, we of course have our principal and vice principal here tonight uh, for other work, but uh, we, you know, we were just uh, amazed to see that, you know, all the different photographs taken of the kids and, you know, the um, experiences that they had throughout the school year. So it was just really lovely. And I know that that happened at all the different elementary schools. So really great to, to see that and experience that firsthand. Okay, um, so moving along, uh, next item on the agenda is under new and continuing business. We have the school improvement plans for Wildwood and Fort River. These are items on our agenda that have been previously discussed um, and we had talked about bringing back um, uh, our principals to talk about the sort of strategic planning that's been going on at the elementary schools uh, now for almost a year. And this was based on conversations that we had had last year as a reminder to the committee and those who are watching uh, at home uh, based on you know, just a continuing conversation about how we can continue to improve the work that's going on in our schools, uh, but also help to sort of draw a finer point, if you will, on the work that's going on there. Um, and with a little bit more focus and more attention to the direction that the schools want to go in, um, you know, to have that conversation here at school committee level and provide an opportunity for community to hear as well what is going on in the schools. So with that, I uh, will turn it over to Dr. Morris, who will introduce then our, our principals. I think we're starting with <coughs> Fort River. Um, and so with us tonight are Dr. Greenfield and Ms. Chamberlain, our vice principal and principal at Fort River. And consistent with the prior work, uh, we're trying to limit the presentation part to about five minutes. Um, they're going to give you the highlights. I know Thank this you. was sent out uh, yesterday, so hopefully you had a chance to review the school improvement plan, which, um, as a reminder to the, both the committee and the community, um, are approved by the superintendent. And we share these with the public for two reasons. One is that this collective input that drives the process, and the second is that that feedback from the school committee can be really valuable for final edits. So that's the purpose of this item. And I think with that, we'll invite our Fort River leadership team to come up. <coughs> and, and just a reminder to, yeah. to make sure the button has been pressed down and it's a bright green light, otherwise they can't hear you. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. And thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. It's our first appearance as a team. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I really like our team. We've just made it through our first uh, our inaugural year, and we're looking forward to round two, so go team. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we wanted to start our presentation with the focus on kids, and just a great representation. These are two of our kindergarten students, now rising first graders, who just completed their first year at Fort River. And just to remind everybody that kids are our, our job, our, our heart, um, and we choose love at Fort River because we want to make sure that our kids feel it every single day. It's the first thing they see when they walk in our building and it really is um, the basis for all the work and the thought that goes into every decision that we make is, is that love that families and students hopefully feel when they come in for us. Oh, yeah, thanks. See, team. Um, so, three of our four, go mm, interesting, oh, what's the screen, gotcha. Three of our four, four goals in our school improvement plan are not new. It's really an ongoing uh, mission for us. Um, a couple of years ago, we kind of introduced this overarching theme of engagement of students and staff and families as um, what everything needs to be based about. How are we improving the engagement of our community? And everything that we do not only is about love, but also about engagement, too, to make sure that we're bringing everybody along with us in our work. Um, in saying that, we also wanted to frame the work around not adding another thing on and widening our breadth, but instead diving deeper and making sure all of our work is really integrated in the solid practices that are happening and diving deeper into those practices and making sure that everything has that connection, that it's not random things that are just piled on top of one another, really making meaning about how do we move through the work together with common goals for our common purpose. Um, we also try to base things on the, the idea that without that engagement of student and families and without feeling safe at school, our instructional practices can never improve. Or without that engagement, we're not going to be able to make the progress with our kids and with our teachers that we want to make. So um, family engagement and social emotional health is the backbone of all of our work. Um, and thinking about 
uh, strategic planning, we did our strategic planning in-house, right? We worked on the dual language planning committee and a large amount of our faculty time this year was in professional learning communities. So we gave our staff autonomy and voice in choosing what area they wanted to work in. We had these general themes of dual language and our three other goal areas that we're gonna dig into a little bit, that teachers got to choose what PLC they joined and their outcomes were recommendations that really was the driving force behind the development of our school improvement plan. So that leads us to where we are now and we have four major goal areas. Thank you. Welcome. Um, four major goal areas. The first one you've heard a lot about, uh, dual language education. <clears throat> So in thinking about dual language education, um, we've done a lot of work in professional development to really think about not just a dual language program, but that our school is a language learning facility. Everybody there comes as a language learner, no matter what language that you're learning or what language is your home language, that you should be prideful of that language and know that we are gonna work together to, to um, bolster up all, everybody's language skills, now both in Spanish and English, but many other areas as well. So we're digging deep into curriculum. We've developed, uh, identified and started this week, you'll hear a little bit more about later, uh, really doing some significant curriculum development from National Geographic Panorama and Canciones y Cuentos, our phonics and general curriculum that we've gotten and went through a long process to determine those through our professional learning community and some feedback from our community constituents. Um, we're working to develop assessment um, and again, more about dual language updates, just did our first kindergarten screening bilingually, which was very exciting and I think pretty successful. It's like really exciting. Um, and we're gonna continue that professional development to make sure that we're representing diversity in our curriculum, to make sure that all languages and, and all um, cultures are represented um, and that our, our entire building also represents an, an underserved population um, and really elevates the status of Spanish language and, and Spanish speaking cultures. That's one goal uh, area. Um, we're also thinking a lot about family and community engagement. That's ongoing work. Um, and again, if we don't have families on board and engage with us, our students are not gonna be with us as well as to the greatest extent we want. Um, so it's really important to, to work on our feedback cycle. We've developed some communication surveys already that are going out soon uh, that you'll see. Um, trying to hear from families about what works for them so they can fully participate in our community in the ways that works for their family and the time that is allotted for their family because everybody has their own host of challenges and we want to make sure we're serving our family's needs and not expecting people to be where they don't feel they need to be, um, but also providing a wider range of opportunities to be with us in ways that we may not have thought of already. Um, so we want engagement from families to the fullest extent possible that works for them. Great. And our third goal is around enhancing the instructional practices that we already have in place. Um, so we're using a multi-tiered systems of support to think about the structures and systems in schools that um, we use to support all kids, bilingual kids, kids with disabilities. Um, and this frame is used to be able to think about the different kind of levels of support that kids need. So that's the frame. Um, and a lot of the instructional practices and models that we've been using, like um, co-teaching, um, small group instruction, um, the use of project-based learning, um, and thinking maps are all practices we've been using. Um, but what our hope is is that when we visit classrooms, which we do very often, um, we wanna be certainly seeing kids more engaged and we wanna see the increased use of these um, practices. And um, so we already know what works um, and we just need to know um, who it's working for and who it's not um, and make tweaks uh, accordingly. Um, so we're looking for kids to be talking with one another, smiling, happy, more kids talking than teachers talking. Um, so the focus there is um, pretty in-depth, um, goal three, um, but we feel confident about those practices. And then the fourth goal is around the social and emotional development for students. So what we know is that um, if kids are not available for learning, it makes teaching and learning difficult, right? So we need to be thinking about um, how we're gonna align our social and emotional curriculum and how we're gonna think about shared language in our building. So we have some pieces in place already um, using PBIS structures and um, school-wide use of evidence-based practices. 
But we've decided, again, out of this PLC, um, to use CASEL, which is a, the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, to guide this framework to guide our work. Um, so there's much more work to be done in the coming years about um, the kind of curriculum that works best for kids at which age, um, and the kind of shared language that's developmentally appropriate for kids ranging uh, K through six. And I think that's it on those four goals. So there's a lot in there. Um, this is clearly an overview. So just to kind of wrap it up, one of the things that we've deliberately chosen uh, is language around <clears throat> providing opportunities to our kids and making sure that our overarching goal is to reduce the opportunity gap and provide access to education for all of our students. So many people have heard about the achievement gap, right? And in 2007, Gloria Lazen Billings kind of shifted uh, the paradigm there and really made the onus, um, the focus back on educators that we need to be thinking about the resources, just like you were speaking about before, the resources we provide to our kids to provide them opportunities, rather than focusing on the outcomes that they may not largely be responsible for sometimes because they might not have the resources. So our onus is on providing those opportunities for students to make sure they can reach their highest potential. Uh, so in three years, we want to make sure we see students learning and growing in two languages. We want to make sure our families know about the resources that we can offer them, know about how to access those resources at school, uh, with those, uh, those resources at school, know how to participate in the community if they so choose, um, and know how to make sure that they get all the information and questions that they want answered. Um, we want to make sure that we're seeing those observable high leverage practices that Renee was speaking to, and she named all those specifically, co-teaching, small group instruction, project-based learning all to the end of increased student engagement. And again, you trust us with your babies. Two of you specifically trust us with your babies. <laughs> um, and we want to make sure that they report feeling safe and happy and that they want to be at school. That's our story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a pause there for a second just to see if the committee has any questions or comments, either for Dr. Morris or for principals. Dr. Morris, is there anything that you wanted to add or comment on for this? Yeah. So uh, two things, actually, if that's okay. I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the work that this school has taken on this year. Um, so the implementation of the dual language program has taken a significant amount of resources and energy um, for staff. And, and I'm not just, I am referring to the administrative, but I'm actually referring to the, the entire Fort River staff. And to maintain the focus on the things that aren't dual language has been a challenge, but really I appreciate the leadership team and how they've structured faculty meeting time and other times during the school day so that dual language, which rightfully could have taken over, not rightfully, but easily could have taken over all the work um, to implement at kindergarten next year, uh, didn't. And so I, I really think it's notable and I wanna acknowledge that. And also, as Ms. Chamberlain said, they chose to do this work or chose, I mean, we collectively made the decision that there were so many external vendors and su consultants supporting the dual language piece that adding an additional layer of someone else leading strategic planning work didn't make sense. So th that made sense from a kind of timeline, resources, time perspective, but it also put a larger onus on the leadership team, both the formal leadership team here, but also the school instructional leadership team that operates at Fort River to do that. And, and I think that's an important context because I, almost every meeting I had with Ms. Chamberlain this year, it started like, we'll talk about dual language, but we've got to talk about the rest of the school too. And, and so I think I appreciate that focus, the ability to focus on multiple things at once, which is certainly part and parcel of the principal's day-to-day -day existence. But, but in this case, when there's a major initiative going on in your school and to recognize that the majority of students aren't directly affected right away by that and to maintain that energy and that focus on, on the rest of the school, both the monolingual class next year in kindergarten, but also the school-wide focus on instructional practice, social emotional learning, everything you saw is particularly notable. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanna say also um, thank you to both of you for not just for this presentation, but for the incredible work that's obviously gone into a lot of the planning. And um, I think for, for me personally sitting on this committee, I am always looking for the, when we have these kinds of presentations about what's going on in a school is to see that continuity of thought, right? And you know, not just adding new things, but really trying to continue the goals that have been set previously. And maybe you fine tune them, maybe you set some new objectives 
Um, but in order for there to be progress, there has to be sort of a, you know, an anchor that's been put in place and then movement from there. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate also the incredible amount of detail that went into this document um, in your presentation. You know, it, it shows, again, a lot of thought in bringing in staff, which is incredibly important for, for something like this. Um, so seeing no other comments from, oh, Mr. Dumling, I guess you have a comment. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it just, just occurred to me as Dr. Morris was, was talking. Um, so from, from a Fort River perspective, you know, um, you, you, one, one opportunity you have is that you have two of our elementary schools specialized special ed programs like Building Blocks and Ames. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm thinking about those four goals and how that affects family engagement, how it affects structural, instructional practices and a school identity. And um, you could just share just from a high level view how how that affected your thought process going through and, and like where you are now as you, as you add, you know, yet another, another aspect to the community of dual language. So I think both Dr. Greenfield and I look at neurodiversity as a huge asset, right? And we also look at the resources that having those programs in our building offer us to the betterment of our staff and our whole community. So it's an asset-based model, just like we want students to think about their assets and use those to um, allow their personal growth. We use that as an asset in our building as well. But there's certainly, it's all tied into those four goals as well because you we wanna make sure those students have every opportunity provided to them because they are carrying something that makes life even a little bit more challenging perhaps. Um, so uh, it's an asset for us and we infuse the work um, in thinking about social emotional development of our students. The expertise that's offered to us as well is something that we can integrate into our professional development we use our psychologist, we use our BCBA uh, to, uh, to a huge uh, extent to the benefit of our entire staff. So um, I'm very glad they're here and part of our community. I'd welcome you to yeah. add. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is that we have like internal consultants at all mm -hmm. time. <laughs> you know, so the folks that work in those particular programs, many of which gravitated to the social emotional mm -hmm. um, PLC, which is not surprising, right? So their expertise <laughs> is sort of commingled with their colleagues. And then from their work is, is the goal that we're suggesting that we work on. So um, it only strengthens our programming. So I think about it also in relationship to, to the dual language program, right? We now have three specialized programs in our building to the asset of our entire community. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima. Thanks. So um, I, I mean, I'm impressed with the, the depth of the work represented in the, in the plan, and particularly because we've been following in a lot of depth, the dual language thing mm -hmm. all year, and I know that that has also represented a huge um, work stream as well. One, I guess one question I have in here is that when I'm looking through a lot of the detail and sort of signs of success, knowing that, that the objectives you have are, are, I don't want to call them lofty because they're right, but the point is they're also, they're you know, there, there are a lot to accomplish, particularly in an integrative way in a, in a, in a really broad and diverse community. And so I'm, I'm thinking as you're looking out over the next year or even the next couple of years, um, apart from sort of the, the, the activity metrics that you have, how do you think about developmentally, knowing in other words that if you're doing something over a period of, you do it four months, then you do it eight months, and then you do it 12 months, and then you do it 16, and not every moment is a milestone where you say, hey, look, we did it, right? Mm -hmm. um, which in some weird way, even like when you go through the dual language thing, after a year, you'll have a group of kindergartens, you're advancing to first grade. And so you're gonna learn just through that, that process, sequential process, you're gonna learn something about how you're doing. Mm -hmm. But for the broader goals, I'm just curious how you're thinking about measuring or assessing your progress along those, those four goals in that sort of integrative way about improving the overall environment in the school. Well, sure, some of the measures are noted in here yeah. too. We wanna to take informal assessments along the way. We wanna survey our families. We wanna survey our students. Um, our academic data certainly will drive our, our feedback cycle um, to see if we're, we're doing well. Um, also observational data for our faculty. Um, we wanna make sure that we're using our time well to support their development, and then when we're spending time on developing those things, we want to make sure we're seeing it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And if we're not seeing it in the classroom, investigating on what resources do you need to make sure you can execute these things in the classroom. And then going back to that data on the student outcome to see how their success, what, what's happening with their success, and, and 
uh, so on and so forth. And again, we need families along the way to give us the measure about what they're hearing at home, what they're seeing at home, and, and how they're feeling in our building as well. And the other thing I would add, because I think lofty is, uh, actually we use that word today. <laughs> we were like, wow, this is lofty. But there's three years, and I think part of our thinking that doesn't sort of come out in here tangibly is that in order to do this work, um, we think a lot about distributive leadership, right? So it's not just us. So when we think about um, these four goals, we have to have instructional leaders in our building that we work tightly with that will help guide us um, to think about how to really unpack data that informs our work um, and shifts our thinking. Because what we know is that we can't think through this, just the two of us, that the data that we're gathering won't just be us, um, and that this distributive leadership model is really the only way to sort of get after a very lofty improvement plan. And I think with that support, we have very skilled educators in our building, so I'd like to give a shout out to them while we're here. Very skilled educators, and um, with that collaboration, I think, I think we're on the right track. Great. Thank you again. I just want to say one more thing, yeah. too, because I'm really glad we get to present and have Wildwood here with us. Because I think, and I know Nick and I just talked about this today as well, that we're not silos in our schools, right? We learn from one another and have a very, um, I think, collaborative approach to learning from one another and making sure that if something's working well in one school, that we kind of check that out and see how we can incorporate that into our work. So I really appreciate the learning community that Amherst Schools provides us all. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for you having us. Really appreciate it. Um, before we move on to the next item, I just realized looking at the agenda that we have here tonight, it's not exactly the same agenda that we had sent out to the committee and that was posted. Uh, so I just need to call attention to that, I think, um, publicly. And I can, I can read it aloud. Um, this is the committee, this is the agenda that the committee would have received in the packet. So uh, we're on schedule. <laughs> Uh, for, so our conversation tonight is actually uh, starting with the strategic plans for Wildwood and Fort River, which is where we are right now, um, and then followed by a dual language update at 6.50 p.m., the capital facilities update at uh, approximately 7 o'clock, school choice update at 7.15, and then the superintendent evaluation with possible vote at 7.20 and then the FY20 school committee planning at 7.50, followed by uh, gifts at 8 o'clock, and then a possible or hopeful adjour adjournment at 8.05, not 8.30 as the agenda shows here. So I just wanted to make sure that we're correcting that for the record. Um, again, the agenda that the committee received and the agenda that was posted is the one that I just read right now. So the one that we just have printed here uh, appears to have been an error. With that, I will turn it back to Dr. Morris uh, to welcome our next guest. So as I set up, I'll describe that we have uh, Principal Nick Yaffe and Assistant Principal Allison Estes here from Wildwood and I think a number of um, interested parties from Wildwood who participated in the development of the plan and the, in terms of the um, school council also have opted to come and, and participate in tonight's or at least observe tonight's presentation. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And I think the new environment is wonderful, but the changing of computers and <laughs> flash drives and the like is a little new to us. So I apologize for the delay. No worries. Yeah. Keep tap dancing, Mike. What's that? Keep tap dancing. You got something to have, right? I could, I could keep going if you want me to. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. It um, seems like I, I was looking to see if Maybe it was just a simple plug, but it seems like maybe they need some sort of adapter, so. Yes, so, um, so I think uh, two things that I wanna follow up on Ms. Chamberlain's comment, which is that um, there are many through lines between these two plans, both with each other, but also with Crocker Farms, which was presented in May. And so that was um, not by design, there was no directive saying that these, th these three plans have to align, but I think it shows that our work, you know, both collectively, um, as a leadership team does infuse into what happens at the school level. And it also sets a much better path for us in terms of the work that we at central office need to do to support building leaders um, because there's so much overlap between the, the three schools and what their plans are and, and it really helps us be efficient in how to support them both from a professional development perspective as well as a financial resource perspective. And then I think... Thank you. Thank you. 
So, Mr. Yaffe, I'm just going to ask you to make sure that your mic is turned on, the bright green light is on, otherwise we can't hear you, and uh, folks at home can't hear you. <laughs> is it not very well? So is the light on? There should be a bright green light on? Yes, it does seem to be on. Oh, there it is. Now it is. Thank you, Dr. Morris. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Okay. I think we're, we can see it here, but we can't see it up there. Okay. Thank goodness for Allison. Anything I have to do? Oh, that's my to time it. Oh, you're timing us. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we can see it here. Is there here. something I need can't... to do here? So maybe I'll suggest that I think if you could start orally, and then Ms. Figueroa is working on this system to try to get okay. it projected. But everyone, all the, the school committee has the full draft plan yep. in front of them. So if that's OK with, with both of you, that'd be great. So you should feel free to get started. You can okay. just start orally and we'll, they'll catch yep. up. <laughs> All right, so what I'm looking at is an image, but I, I can describe it to you. It's really an image of the Wildwood community uh, in a circle on the first day of school. And so, you know, we see this, this process has been one that's important for us at this time, as we talked about in March and at the beginning of the year, for us at Wildwood to say, this is what we believe in as a community, this is what we are, we have come together to say this is what we value. That the work as, as Diane and, and the uh, Crocker Farm staff said is, is work that we're building on that we started really nine years ago with the redistricting. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is to talk about really what an amazing community is. So the demographics of Wildwood and Fort River and Crocker Farm are similar. Hi everybody. Uh, <laughs> that you just have to go to an event at Wildwood or an event or just greeting the buses to say that this is an amazing community and what an awesome responsibility we have to, mm -hmm. to serve it well. So I'm gonna move into the next phase, um, which is why this is important at this time. Besides talking about, there we, yeah. Hi, Sean, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to take a recess for a couple minutes until we fix this? Is that a... Why don't we take a five minute recess while we fix the, the technology? Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna take a five minute recess. So picture, it's a thousand words. Sorry, I'm so, sorry, Mr. Yaffe, I gotta okay. say that again because okay, uh, otherwise it's not being recorded. So uh, calling the meeting back to order at 6.40 p.m. Now you may continue. Thank you everyone for bearing with us. Thank you, Thank you. so here's the picture. Uh, of the Wildwood community, um, gathering on the first day of school with all the hopes and aspirations of our students and our families and making wishes for the new year. Okay. And here's our demographics. And the demographics really don't tell the story. Like I said, there's every day when Allison and I and other staff are out greeting the buses, the thrill that I have, that we have in just greeting the students and who we are um, as a community or every school event when we look out, recently we had the end of the year picnic, and you look out on the hillside of, sta of families who are gathered, you just realize how lucky, how lucky we all are to serve such a community. So I want to start in that way, and I was telling Diane, I'm so glad that she used the word love as the centerpiece. So the love that we have, and that's really what we want uh, to have our every child, every staff member, every student uh, feel and family. And so this is why the work is important at this time. The other thing that we hear from families is that we want to have a K to, they want, we want to have more of a K to six alignment, uh, more consistency in every aspect of this plan. So this gave us an opportunity as staff to come together and say, okay, work out, what do we believe in? What can we all commit ourselves to? Over the past few years, we've hired a lot of amazing new staff members in their 20s. And uh, we want them to understand what Wildwood is about, what they're entering, and families to know our vision. And as Diane said, 
the alignment with Crocker Farm and Fort River is there. It's for all of us to see and to work together and it provides a direction for the future. So we engaged in this process over the past year in which all the people of our community came together to jointly design a vision for the entire community with family and staff and students working together. Um, we had inquiry groups and we modeled the inquiry process that we expect our students to use where we were making sure that our different stakeholders are represented. As we were doing this, we synthesized our thoughts into different pillars that uphold the vision that we developed jointly, and then we developed one SMART goal for each pillar of our community. And so we also developed a vision statement, and as I was looking through the vision statement today, I was telling Allison, well, you can pick out key things. One is that everybody at Wildwood agreed that welcoming is the foundation of our community. That's one thing that we feel like is so important. And that, as Fort River talked about, similarly, we want students to be actively engaged in their own learning. And this conversation started many years ago. They developed skills through inquiry, leading to real world learning. And then the other thing that we came together as a staff to just say that equity and a commitment to social justice drive all that we do. Ta -da. Here they are, this is Allison's visual. <laughs> <laughs> the five pillars. Yeah. Want to say anything more about that? Well, I mean, each pillar is an example of the five areas that people felt were pivotal to the Wildwood community. Um, the the fact that equity happens to be in alphabetical order is, and also in the center. It was interesting how that was just so important for every single group to ensure that there was equity represented in every single a pillar. So that's really one of the things that ties through with all the pillars. And, um, and of course, none of them work without the other. So that was one of the things that became evident to us. Um, do you want to talk about character? Yeah, the other thing that, uh, well, we really saw this, even though they look separate, they're not. So in the first one thing of that, and strengthening character. So what's our goal for what every Wildwood student to become strong in their own character and their sense of self? that's woven into everything else. So you walk into a classroom, you'll see a book group uh, discussion, and then within that, students are reflecting on, well, how was I as a participant? Did I listen to every voice? So that's just a small example of how character can be a part of everything. And our goal in character focuses on restorative circles. Um, that is a pivotal process to making sure that we are teaching students that common language in order to hear every voice and provide that ability for each person within the group to feel important. So circles be became a part of what we started to do as the adult community and, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we call, what we're calling unifying principles across Wildwood. So one unifying principle is this the idea that all the adults are participating in what we're asking kids to learn. And so that's one example where we as an adult community started to use restorative circles for us to deepen our relational trust with each other. And so that was the, that's the smart goal for the equity pillar. Um, in curriculum, what you'll see is this um, overlap between curriculum design and student engagement. So as a staff, we want to go deeper into project-based learning and what we've what we're doing in that is, is, is going deeper into how we design curriculum. So we're using a template for us in terms of making sure that these key essential elements of project-based learning are in every curriculum unit that we design. Similarly, with engagement, the idea of going deeper into students' owner, ownership of their own learning. So I'm gonna, we're gonna show you a little bit at the end because we want students to be seen uh, a, a, an example of a digital portfolio. So the SMART goal in that area is that all students will reflect on their own learning through a portfolio process. Now, the families, the families yeah. partnership, yes. Um, so our main goal in family partnerships is making sure that we are not only getting information out to families um, in a unified way, K through six, but also having a process for collecting feedback from them in a very structured way to make sure we're hearing all families. 
this is one of the things that we felt is not being done well enough yet. We hear from some families more than others, and it's vital that we are working towards making sure that all families are being heard. And if we are not hearing from them, making sure we have processes in place to, to ensure that their voice is there. So the last thing before we show this short video is really thinking about these unifying principles. So as you read this, what, what I pulled out, what we pulled out is this is things that are connecting all of this whole vision together. So one is about the adult community and the student community coming together. The other you'll see is a strong emphasis on relational trust and how do you build that in schools and research has actually shown that that's one of the strongest <coughs> indicators of school success. That learning is a social phenomena that we, the, we as adults and students are teaching, we're teaching our students how to collaborate the sense that a spirit of inquiry is in everything that we do, and recognizing the importance of a growth mindset both for adults and for kids, and that in our community, the adult community and the student community are open to feedback and reflect on our, our own learning, and that deeper learning is valued as opposed to superficial learning. So we're going to end just on, that's okay? I hope, hope we can show. hear it. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> So before we start, sorry, Allison, before we start, so this is an example of, of the power of film and, and students filming. Uh, these are sixth graders. They were told by their teacher, we're going to do this presentation about the digital portfolios. We're just going to show one minute. Uh, they had trouble, as filmmakers do, in cutting it down. To <laughs> <laughs> so it's just one minute. It's just an ongoing cousin. struggle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's see how it yeah. goes. Do we have sound? Oh. Oh, so we might not get sound. Oh, well. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. The sound is on. It's not really okay. It's okay. <laughs> so with all of this, hopefully, will get posted as a Google site, and so you'll be able to see it and truly honor their efforts. I'm looking at Dr. Morris, and he's nodding his head, saying, yes, so these will be posted. So yes. we can certainly uh, take a look later on and, um, and maybe even share it. <laughs> Great. So, so that's the overview. Thank you so much. Um, again, want to pause for the committee to see if there's any questions or comments um, for Dr. Morris or for our principals. Mr. Dumling. Yeah, I'll skip the, this work is all amazing and I love all the everything that you do kind of speech in the interest of time. Um, so you've mentioned project-based learning before. I've heard you speak pretty passionately about that before you just talked about that. Can you just talk a little bit more about, like, just for me, like the general public, what, what, what's a, a useful definition of what that is and, and how do you, how do you envision that go when it goes well, what does that look like? What is, what is your vision of like really good project-based learning? That's great, great question. So um, I think we have examples of this happening. You know, first of all, I think it would be a sense that students, so there's the elements that I would want to see is that there's some kind of a driving question, that students are engaged actively in, in a question that's been raised that they feel is, is connected to the real world, that they're doing inquiry, they don't know the answer at the beginning, that there's some level of, of uh, reflection on the process where they're being given feedback, they're understanding and they're reflecting on their own learning, and then there's a public presentation to an authentic audience. So uh, integrating the arts is a part of this. We have examples, so recently the the uh, third grade team now has done this for a couple of years, working with our librarian and our science coordinator uh, to develop animal adaptations. So that's been a unit that we had. So some of it can be uh, go developing or expanding on what we're already doing as a, as a school. Um, so they, did, they chose the animal. They did research on it. They had uh, scientists from the Fish and Wildlife um, facility nearby. Our librarian taught them key research skills in the inquiry cycle process, and then they did a presentation. This year we even added um, where one of our parents is in the dance education department, so they actually um, came in and taught the kids how to do some improvisational dance around their animal. So we want to do more training. I mean, we definitely, you know, the sabbatical is about, for Chris Egemeyer is a big part of that. Um, and having people 
uh, start to train in this area. The colleges in this area now are very interested about Holyoke College, and now UMass is sponsoring a summer uh, project-based learning um, uh, workshop for teachers. I, I want to say that when I know that project-based learning is not happening is when you have a student say, how many pages do I have to write? Because <laughs> that is exactly the opposite of where you want people to delve into a question they have and not feeling hampered by constraints of you know, how many words and things like that. This is your own curiosity and you're trying to figure out how to explore that from different frameworks. And we're trying to open it up so it's not about you need one nonfiction book you know, in the, you know, it's not about that. It's about how do you use the resources we have in order to explore something you really are curious about. And there's some aspect of student voice and choice. I think that came out in the, in the uh, inquiry group around curriculum design and student engagement that we're looking for ways for student voice and choice to be included. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I think this is Wonderful, and thank you. It's been great to see that evolution happen of this, uh, this work that's going on at Wildwood. So really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, my question is actually focused on uh, buy-in, I guess, for staff and educators in the building. Um, you know, again, some of this is work that you've started previously. Some of it is, is new, at least to us, and I'm assuming maybe to, to the team that you have in the, in the building as well. Um, how are you ensuring that staff and educators are picking up on these goals and, and buying into that? Is there a process in place for that? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think one of the things that's so important is that every single group was a part of developing each of the goals and making sure that this was connected to previous work that was already happening in parts of the building, maybe not across the building K through six. So there is not one part of this plan that you'll say, oh, I've never seen that before. That's not something that we have ever said. So aligning things across the grade levels is so important, but knowing that we have examples of excellent work happening in different areas that we can pull on to give as exemplars to um, all staff, I think is really important. And that is a part of the um, using staff leaders in the building to help make sure that this is not uh, coming from one area. This is coming from the community. This is coming from different areas within our, our building. And we can rely on the experts within our building to help forward the work. It took a long time. I mean, <laughs> and to, to do this, is a, you know, one of the reasons we weren't ready in May is because yeah. the collaborative process took a while. Because what we did is each group developed this, and then we had a whole sort of um, carousel type of experience, a staff where they were, everybody wrote down feedback and then the feedback had to be analyzed. And at the same time, I, I have to say that, you know, there, it wasn't 100% agreement, but I think in school change, you also nudge people towards mm -hmm. like doing what you feel is best for kids and for the school. I think the other part about buy-in that is real is that if teachers see like, wow, this is more fun, or this is a, I, I'm happier as a teacher. Like the student-led open house is an example of that. Not everyone bought into that before we did it in October, but we had heard it was great in Crocker Farm. Uh, but once we did it, it's like many of the feedback forms we got were like, wow, this was great. I really enjoyed this much more. Yeah. The, the teachers were saying that. That's great, yeah. that's great. So it is a, it is a good question <clears throat> to ask. And just very quickly also, uh, you had mentioned collecting feedback from all families, which I think is great and something that we all struggle with. Um, and so I was wondering if you could describe just what your process, what you envision doing differently. <laughs> so one of the processes is making sure that we brainstorm at the beginning of the year with the groups of volunteer staff members who want to be a part of that group. And so we're going to um, collect different ideas. It's going to go mainly from the classroom teachers, but also using different um, related services staff and different areas so that that's not all only on their um, plate. But because the teachers are in contact with families, making sure that if they're having trouble reaching a family, how do we support them? Because mm -hmm. that's the part where um, we don't want that to be a crack, that people are falling through. I had trouble talking. I had trouble reaching. I had, you know, whatever the reason is, how do we make sure that that family's understood in terms of what they see as the strengths of the community, the, the things that they're seeing their child struggle with? 
um, and having opportunities at, we're, we're thinking that we'll start at the report card cycle because we are expecting something back at the report card, but right now we don't have a system in place to make sure and ensure that every family has seen that report card. Mm -hmm. And so then we'll have that as our first benchmark period. And then in the spring, we'll have one more, which doesn't rely on a report card cycle. It's gonna be an extra cycle of how do we get that information. We can't rely just on surveys and technology because not all of our families have access to that. So that's where we're gonna to have to use our PLC, the inquiry group that was designed around this to figure out a design that's not going to overwhelm people, but will helpfully make, give them information that they truly need. Because every teacher really wants to see what, what is my family's, what do they think that I'm doing well? What, is, what needs reinforcement? And if we can get them better information at more frequent times of the year, I think that that could help them feel a sense of effectiveness in their jobs. Great. Well, thank you uh, again very much for, for coming tonight and for all this work that you've put into this. Looking forward to seeing your, your progress, continued progress. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Okay, um, so moving us on, uh, the next item on the agenda is our dual language update. Sure. So we may be welcoming. <laughs> so, uh, no more visuals. So, no uh, more visuals. We invited ourselves to participate in this one. <laughs> so, uh, Welcome back. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So I, I've kind of got five things to say. I'll start with a narrative um, that I think is helpful and then talk about hiring, professional development, Seeing it in Mike, see? It wasn't our imagination. <laughs> <Must enter. laughs> yes, the blight was on, but it wasn't our imagination. It right. did not sound on. Okay. So we're back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's a, so what would you like me to do? If you don't mind repeating that story again, sure. maybe just the introduction, because I actually think it was a very powerful story, and I want everyone to be able to hear that. Sure. And I'll with do, apologies, uh, Dr. Morris, for be the, the failings of technology. <laughs> we have a very fancy room, but we are still learning how to work everything. So, yeah. um, so I, I, what, I, what I shared before was an anecdote of being, you know, I framed as being in the right place at the right time with three children, one entering the dual language program and two who are current Fort River students. And uh, one of the older students saying to the younger student, you know, it's so neat you're gonna be learning in English and Spanish, turning to another um, third grade student saying, you know, you could tutor this child because your first language is Spanish. And the soon to be kindergarten student excitedly saying, yeah, you'll tell me all the words, you're gonna help me as I'm learning this. And to the affective reaction of the, of the third grade student whose first language is English, English is still, that student's still acquiring, her first language was Spanish, excuse me, a uh, student who's acquiring English and the elevation of the language and honoring of the culture that's going to be happening. And, and the piece that's so important to me in addition to the curriculum and the instruction and all the research is that's the kind of, when we think about opportunity gaps, we think about what, uh, how we want to honor cultures in, the, in our school district. I got a small snapshot of what that looks like and you know I feel very fortunate to be present to observe it and I'm, I feel very fortunate that we have the staff and uh, your all commitment as well as the staff at Fort Rivers commitment to follow through on that promise because absent that uh, you know that 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 experience doesn't happen for that third grade student he doesn't experience Spanish language uh, and culture being elevated in that same way if we were doing you know a, a wonderful world language program that was you know, an accessory to the core academic, that conversation wouldn't have happened in the same way. The fact that it actually is part of the core academic curriculum of what students will start experiencing is influencing students who are not even going to be directly affected uh, in their educational experience by the program. And so I just, I wanted to share that anecdote to start in terms of update, because I think it, it probably better than anything else I share shows some of the, the power that the implementation is having on students who are not actually yet kindergarten students. That's great, and if I may, Dr. Yeah, Morris, I just wanted to say, I think um, that is one of the, the main goals of starting this dual language program, right, was, you know, one of the goals was recognizing the benefits of, of bilingualism, period, to normal development and education, um, and trying to find a formal way of doing that in our district. Um, but the other goal was actually also an equity goal, and it was to ensure that um, all of our students feel valued and understand their 
the, what they bring to the table. And it's not just them acquiring skills that other people have, but that they can actually share back and create um, this you know, feedback loop um, among their peers and among others and teach others too, because that's the important thing about peer learning. So I really appreciate hearing that um, and having that brought out so starkly because it is something that we've been talking about for a while and it's a beautiful way to hear that and, and, and that have that expressed in that way. So thank you. Thank you, yeah. I know the first time I told it, it was better, so uh, I apologize. <laughs> um, but I think the other thing is you hear a lot just, you know, and I know this, these folks do it more than me, hanging out on playgrounds and seeing what kids are actually saying sometimes is, um, gives you the window that uh, of how kids are experiencing things in a different way than how adults are experiencing them. So it's a good thing for all of us to do. Uh, on the hiring update, we've, um, I think I've updated the committee prior, but we have hired the kindergarten teacher for next year. Um, we're really excited about her and her presence. And we are just about hired um, someone who will be working, um, particularly supporting intervention, you know, for students um, and someone who's fully bilingual, has worked in this, in dual language programs before and, and Massachusetts as well as another state, and that process is wrapping up hopefully this week. Um, and um, so we feel like from a rostering perspective, we're in you know, a very good position uh, of what we hope to be. We do have our kindergarten paraeducator secured too, so she's been doing uh, work this week to develop some of the curriculum. She's on board in our team building events as well. And hopefully, fingers crossed, that we're gonna bring somebody onto her instructional leadership team as well that's bilingual and bicultural if all things go well. Thank you. Uh, on the second front, in terms of professional development, I think it was in the electronic packet. I didn't make it in here, but it was just a quick summary of uh, the professional development that actually started today. Um, so just because it didn't make it in the packet, I'll say it out loud. So today and tomorrow, science with our science coordinator, Jen Reese. Uh, on, let's see, that's Friday. Um, there's continued work with Dr. Wilma Ortiz, who's a former um, staff member at the middle school, now works at Westfield State in higher education specific to team building and culture and climate. Um, again, it's not just about the books and, and, and the reading. Uh, maybe that's Thursday. And then Friday is uh, more work with National Ge Geographic Panorama, which mm -hmm. Ms. Chamberlain spoke about earlier. The following week is curriculum framework with Amy Finn Smith. She was one of the facilitators of La Siembra from, that we did last summer, who is an instructional coach in the dual language program in, in a district in Connecticut. And then three days on curriculum mapping. Um, so we have a lot of work in the next two weeks, and I want to compliment both the leadership team, but also the staff who are dedicating a lot of their um, early summer start, um, so to speak, to making sure that we have uh, dedicated work in place. And sometimes it's really hard, frankly, to do this level of dedicated work while the school year is going on. Mm -hmm. It's not only just getting subs, but it's the dedicated, to really focus on this level, this detail of work, not having to thinking about what's happening in the building is, is critical. So, you know, great job to the team. And Katie Richardson just definitely deserves just make sure we a Katie shout out for her <laughs> organizing of these uh, events because of that and how much she's working. I gave her the night off, but I do want to acknowledge her, her hard work on this. The other thing I think worth noting is that it's not just kindergarten, the kindergarten team that's doing this because we are looking forward to the team mm -hmm. that will be in first grade next year. They're on board doing this work with us as well. So it's not just a one year at a time. We're really trying to think ahead as best we can. So moving to enrollment, we had our lottery um, for, if you remember the groups one and two were um, students coming from uh, at least some Spanish speaking background and groups three or four were English speaking background. Group three was from Fort River, students that were zoned to Fort River. Group four was students zoned um, to Crocker Farmer Wildwood who were interested. So we had our lottery, I can't remember the date, but it was over a month ago, it was a public lottery. You know, we did tell people um, that they didn't need to show up, it wouldn't advance their chances, but we communicated with everybody. With that, we also let them know that depending whether the Spanish side fills up, there may be a second level of lottery. I mean, it's the same lottery, but the second level, of, mm -hmm. second tier of students <clears throat> accepted in early August. Uh, right now, we have all 14 of students who have registered across the district who indicated having some or full Spanish language background have registered for the program. We talked about this throughout the fall, that that was one of our concerns, that we wanted to make sure we were attracting that population to date um, through the good work of, of many people. We've been successful. Jujira Torres, our elementary registrar, also deserves an acknowledgement mm -hmm. for That's her talking, not convincing, but talking and laying out options for families so they knew uh, what the program would look like, uh, regardless of their first language. Um, and uh, we now are in this if we look at last year, which we had 19 students um, in our kindergarten, our 
current graduated kindergartner, I guess we could say, uh, who would fit the profile of having um, significant Spanish language background. We had about 14 registered at this moment in time, so we look like we're roughly on pace for similar sized population. We continue to do outreach and, uh, into, <coughs> into communities to make sure that families are registering, that they're aware of the need to register. And so I think it's highly likely that we will come close to 20, um, that the last six slots in the Spanish speaking side will we'll likely, we, we may not get to 20, but we'll be above 14 if history is any precedent. And we continue that outreach effort uh, throughout our community um, to increase the number of that of registration. And at some point in August, we have to let people on lottery know, you know, we can't leave it to the last day or last week. Um, so we continue. I, yep, I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Morris, but just, I think this is a really important piece uh, of this outreach. Uh, if you could just describe what kind of outreach is taking place during the next few weeks, because August is going to be on us before you know it. <laughs> so we've continued to, through the Family Center and Ms. Richardson and others, um, we had multiple events at different um, locations through town and particularly different uh, locations where our data indicates that families are more likely to register later in the registration period. Um, so we've had hmm, six or seven events, I want to say. Um, and what we continue to do, the outreach at this point is mostly through siblings who are currently in the schools that we have heard rumors that their kindergarten siblings would be coming and encouraging them to register. Um, and we've had some success with that. Um, our number wasn't 14 two weeks ago, but we've mm -hmm. uh, continued to have outreach with current families that we know of mm -hmm. um, that again, you know, students are often reliable reporters, but age of siblings can be a little bit off. Um, but we've reached out specifically to families um, to encourage them, and we have continued to reach out to families who we haven't heard back from or say they're going to come in. I don't know if there's other things that you want to I, mean, I encourage word of mouth, too. So if anybody's aware of the program and the opportunities, if we know of students out there that might be a great fit, we would welcome uh, them to call me to set up an appointment. Um, we do Spanish-speaking staff on board through the summer so we can answer questions. So we would love to push registration for anybody that you think might be out there. Keep I'm, spreading the I'm also just wondering if maybe a, just a you know flyer to some of the uh, neighborhoods or you know apartment mm -hmm. buildings or centers or maybe all of the, of the above mm -hmm. um, over the summer. You know people tend to kind of be out congregating and doing different things and different activities. You know mm -hmm. so maybe if we have some sort of last concerted effort to recruit those last six you know kids, that'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. We'll do that. Thank great. you for suggesting. That. And lastly, family engagements. You saw a flyer that was in the electronic packet that was sent with an event, you know, hopefully weather permitting, perhaps. <laughs> oh, it's rain or shine. We'll do it inside. Okay. We have My to. apologies. <laughs> uh, tomorrow at Fort River with the kindergarten kickoff. And I think it's important to note that while this is a dual language update, all families mm -hmm. who are registered for kindergarten or Fort River are invited because we want to be really conscious that families in dual language program may have specific questions, but we want us to, from the beginning, make sure that all families feel included in the kindergarten experience at Fort River. There's a number of other events that were scheduled um, throughout the summer that are more informal, uh, but opportunities for families in that cohort of, cohort of families to get together and have that community. And it's a good opportunity to thank the PGO for all the work they do, and they're having a welcome back popsicle celebration as they have. But you know, certainly, I think there'll be a more intentional focus this year, given the, that we have more kindergartners coming to Fort River than we've had in some time, mm -hmm. uh, partially because of the dual language program, partially just we had a lot, a lot of kindergarten students register. I mean, since the redistricting, this is the most students that we had register for Fort River, separate from any zoning or students entering the dual language program. And I know Fort River and district staff really want to make sure that this is a big welcome for all students coming to Fort River next year. Mm -hmm. and, and someone said this earlier that we already did screening for the existing kids. So they, they're real, they're <laughs> curious, <laughs> they're um, hilarious, their families have a mix of excitement and nervousness, but the really thing that, the thing that we were most proud of is that we were able to welcome kindergarten families in both languages. Mm -hmm. We were able to systematically look at kids' language levels in English and in Spanish, their literacy levels in English and in Spanish, math. And so I feel like we are really equipped to know their learning profiles so that when they come in September, we don't know them, like we'll know them a year from now, but we really have a good sense of the assets that they're coming to school with. So, so I think that that's really, really valuable in terms of our ability to hit the ground running in late August. There's also little things happening like this year. Um, we've made some signage changes, uh, which is wonderful because we haven't had a strong representation of signage and directionality in our building. But now um, 
the, there's Spanish language that you see painted on the walls, and we're getting Rupert supporting us to get some custom-made uh, signage so people will know where to go, and that certain areas of the building are, are labeled bilingually. So it's just throughout the building and throughout our culture that you see a higher representation of the Spanish language in print, as well as spoken. We have staff members that are learning. Estoy aprendiendo. Uh, Muy bien. <laughs> Renee as well, <laughs> trying a little, little bit. Can't do much more than that right now. Anxiety and cognition down. So, um, But another thing, we've been saying dual language, dual language, dual language. And at tomorrow night's event, we are going to take the list that has been generated by our staff and students of potential names and finally naming the program. Families are going to have the final say kind of through an informal ballot. And they'll, as the pioneers of the program, will get to, to label it for us so we can stop saying dual language and have a very friendly term in Espanol to, to talk about our program. Muy bien. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to pause here for a second just to see if the committee uh, has any comments or question. Ms. Spitzer. Um, first, <coughs> first off, um, it's really nice to be here at the end of the school year and see how far, um, how much progress has been made. And so I just want to say thank you. And I, I think you guys have obviously been working incredibly hard and to pass on that to everybody and the staff. Um, I just had a question about um, enrollment because you did present the numbers for the folks who were on the Spanish, some Spanish language skills, I'm assuming we've totally filled up the 20 other spots. And I was kind of curious just about how that ended up breaking down and are we, how much demand was there out there after um, all of the speculating that was going on? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I think as we started with, unexpected things happen and two unexpected things happen this year, I would say, for me. So one was we had, as I referenced, a much higher than expected enrollment at Fort River. Um, so separate from students who are Spanish language speaking students who would have typically attended Quaker Farm or Fort River, just the catchment area of registration at Fort River was about 50% higher than it's been the last four or five years. So as your mind probably is going, I have lots of thoughts about that. You know, I have no data, hard data, and it is something that we have to look at over time because that does shift some of the dynamic um, as we think about enrollment in this program, was this a one-year blip or is actually this a result of mm -hmm. families being interested who might have made other choices otherwise? Um, it's really hard to know. Um, so I think that was one expect unexpected thing and I would say the interest from Wildwood and Crocker Farm was significant, but I wouldn't say that it was perhaps overwhelming. Um, I think a lot of people had questions at the event we had. We had a kindergarten registration event in April. There were a lot of uh, families not connected to Fort River, English-speaking families who chose to stay and ask good questions, and we stayed, we had an event afterwards. Um, but right now, we actually only accepted one student who was in the group four. If you think of group four, that was English-speaking uh, zone to Crocker Farm or Wildwood. Um, we have 13 students currently on the wait list for that program. I think the odds are probably one or two more will come as a nature of, like if this year is like last year, and we have 19 students who come with some Spanish language background, that'll open up another slot. So we would have anticipated, I think the number I shared was four or five, um, but what was the, the largest variable was the, um, the unexpectedly large size of Fort River Zone students registering. Um, and, and we've seen, uh, some of our other schools like Crocker Farm is lower than we've seen in many years. Um, I attribute that, that you know, I, I think that's likely just an enrollment, um, unexpected enrollment development. Uh, we'll have to look if that's a trend over time. So our overall kindergarten enrollment's pretty average, but the distribution between the school mm -hmm. and Wildwood's about as expected. So our overall enrollment distribution was, was not, did not follow the trends of the last five years. So is that the type of information you were looking? Yeah, I, and um, I just think it's important we keep track of it going forward because ideally, I think in all of our conversations about this, if it works really well, and the, we'd love to see it grow. And I'm wondering if th it seems like there's definitely demand on the side from the monolingual English speaking side, but we may, I don't know if we have the numbers of Spanish speaking models to allow that. So anyways, just. I, and I think that's the right question. I'm sorry, you don't need this acknowledgement for me, but that's the right question to ask is if we're, we're trying to maintain as close to a 50-50 model, and right now our Spanish-speaking population um, this year is 100% is, is registering at Fort River, what would that model look like if we expanded to another school? I think that 
that would be a very different model. I mean, there are districts, and I think we've spoken about this in the past, that have dual language programs with essentially no language models. That's actually a substantively different program. The planning would be different, how you'd structure mm -hmm. would be different, and, and not to say bad, but it, would be, it wouldn't be what we've been talking about. Mr. Nakajima? You, just, you also might have to look for a different language. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the committee? If not, we're just going to move on. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Morris. Thank you so much again. No, Larry. thank you for staying. I appreciate <laughs> thank it. Thank you very much. Excellent work. Thank you. Good to know about tomorrow night, rain or shine. So, yeah, <laughs> so I will be there. All right, next item on the agenda is the uh, capital facilities update. Dr. Yep. Morris, you want to? So, Mr. Roy Clark's going to come up, but let me frame the three parts of this update. One is uh, uh, last month there was an ADA update, some thoughts, and uh, Mr. Roy Clark sent a memo which was in the electronic packet on this topic, uh, about his work with Mr. Mooring and DPW. The second topic is a summer update. Last year at summer we shut down a school and had a lot of troubles when we op reopened it, and so uh, Mr. Roy Clark will share sort of what some of the summer work is and how we're avoiding that same scenario from reoccurring. And the third one I probably can do, based on a meeting I had this afternoon, just there's some questions about Fort River in particular and the field usage um, at the elementary schools. Um, this has been more of a topic at the regional level and will continue to be next week, but I think because one of the fields that's used is at the elementary level, I think I can give a, a brief update on that third topic. But I'll turn to um, Mr. Roy Clark for the ADA piece. Oh, my light is lit. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, you have a, about a half a page document in your, in your bundle with some updates from the last time I spoke with you all about the uh, ADA capital improvement project. Um, and I'd like to just sort of briefly summarize some of the major points and, and maybe fill in a, a few uh, details uh, where needed. Um, I met with uh, Guilford Mooring from, uh, from the town and we looked at all three elementary schools and issues with the driveways and the parking spaces and the sidewalks and the curb cuts and all of that stuff. Um, and um, it became very quickly evident that we wouldn't be able to get anything done this summer. All of the paving contractors are already booked solid. Um, and it also became evident that any major work in the um, uh, traffic areas uh, wouldn't be able to take place when school was in session. So, I want to push all of that stuff off till next summer. Um, I'm still trying to get feedback uh, from folks on some of the issues that were raised in the study. Um, for instance, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out uh, how strong the impact is of having the, the accessible parking space be uh, more strongly sloped than ADA requires um, because those are expensive fixes and if it's a relatively low impact for our community that will help me prioritize. So I'm reaching out to folks and hopefully anybody who's watching can also get back to us and say, yeah, it bothers me or no, I don't know. <coughs> um, uh, but I'm ho also hopeful that we can get some sidewalk repair work done this fall um, that wouldn't impinge on, on traffic and on, um, uh, on, on buses and vans uh, in the same way. Uh, so I'm working with um, with Guilford to try to figure out what we can do and if there's things that we can roll up into other town projects uh, through a joint bid. And I'm hoping that we can get something um, really firmed up by the end of July. Um, so that said, um, the other outdoor things that I had prioritized with my initial scheme, um, I've had fairly good support from the staff that I've talked to yet that, that yes, the things that I thought would be most significant are ones that bother them a lot. Um, uneven ground, uh, access to playgrounds. Um, a few things got elevated in my, um, in my understanding of, of, of what would have a, a big impact, um, particularly um, uh, some courtyard access and uh, getting some uh, accessible tables inside as well as outside. So I expect I'll be, uh, and that's not in the, in the thing, the inside table things happened after I drafted this. Um, so th those are all things that I'm hoping to look for this summer and try to get in place where I can in selected locations. Um, 
or can I jump in? Sure. Just in terms of the feedback, the names on the bottom may not be familiar to the committee, but Michelle Regan Ladd is the preschool coordinator, and our preschool is an integrated preschool, so um, often works with students, and you know, um, who have um, disabilities is based on an integrated model. And Betsy Todd and Greta Camp are the um, teachers of the ILC program, the Integrated Learning Center at Wildwood. Who um, those three staff members are the ones who are most closely connected to um, the majority of students with pretty intensive disabilities. It's not that there aren't students that aren't connected to those three people, but in terms of gathering feedback, the reason that Mr. Roy Clark chose those is that they are, they are the resident experts on disability and access in terms of our staff and in terms of the students they work with. I'm sorry to jump ahead, but I, I know that those three names may not be May not have meaning. With That's that fine. Then. And then also, uh, this packet that we currently have in front of us does not have uh, that document that you're referring to, although it was emailed to us uh, last week. But it's not currently in front of the committee, so we'll have to take your word for it right now. <laughs> does anybody want my copy? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, and they're particularly in, engaged with uh, the younger populations, where uh, there's all kinds of. Um, additional difficulties just because of size and, and you know it's just hard for kids to navigate an adult world when they're small. Um, so that was another reason why it was uh, uh, great to talk with them. Um, I will say that um, generally the, the, the climate in the construction world um, is not that good for us. Prices are high, uh, everyone is busy, there's more work out there than people can do. Um, and this is true for us, this is true for public projects all over Western Mass. Not just paving, but all kinds of projects. Um, so how to navigate the, and, and predict what will happen in the business future is, is, is another challenge that I want to at least tell you I'm, I'm thinking about and I'm, I'm aware that, that it, we're in a dynamic situation in terms of how, what, what contracts get bids and what kind of bids would be competitive. Um, um, and also uh, on the ADA part, um, uh, that's, uh, that, that's most of what I wanted to cover on the ADA part, but I'm, I'm happy to go through these and fill you in on the points that are not in front of you, if you'd like. Um, in terms of the elementary schools, we have all of the systems running, all the chillers are running, um, everything is going to be up and running all summer. We don't have any expectations for any major projects in any of the, of the elementary schools. Um, we're going to be doing deep cleaning, working around all of the various programs that happen in the summertime, um, which has its own challenges, but um, uh, we've got dedicated staff and I think they're going to do a great job this summer. I could add to that. Um, I think the other thing that I know you've shared with me um, is just the having our summer programs are primarily at Crocker Farm because um, that's where the district um, summer school programs are. There's multiple programs. And just also the routine, you talked about deep cleaning, but also the maintenance of fans and belts and, and work that wasn't possible last year. Um, just, and you've talked about, you know, with me about routines that are now built in, right. weren't built in last year. I don't know right. if you could speak yeah. to that so a little bit. Yeah, we, so, right, there's the deep cleaning side of it, and there's also the, the, the air quality and uh, um, temperature and humidity and, and filtering issues, and we'll be working on, we have several teams working on, on both different um, aspects, and that's part of the plan. Um, uh, and um, so far, everything is working just great. Thank you. Um, so I have a few questions, but I'm going to hold my questions because I just want to make sure that, that, to see if the committee has any comments or questions that they would like to share first before I dive in. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you, Mr. Roy Clark, for being here tonight. Again, really appreciate it. Um, I think you know it's it's helpful to hear that you have met with Superintendent Mooring um, to review all the concerns in the different buildings. We certainly have heard. Uh, starting from last, you know, spring actually, uh, about many of the concerns both inside and outside the elementary school buildings and the facilities and the grounds and all of that. So it's great to hear someone is walking that with the, the person in charge in the town 
uh, for making those kinds of repairs and doing that kind of maintenance outside. Um, I think, you know, I probably am not alone when I express an incredible amount of frustration that a lot of this work has not happened yet and that we're at this stage where we are right now. Um, it seems like we're playing catch up constantly. And so um, that's not a reflection on you in any way. If anything, it's to say thank you for, for taking the lead on this really, you know, is important um, to keep this moving. Uh, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, you mentioned pushing off, you know, some of these more major repairs that would interfere with uh, traffic and other things like that to next summer uh, because we wouldn't be able to do that this summer since it's already so late in the, in the year, the calendar year. Uh, so I'm wondering what the timeline is for beginning those inquiries and the bidding process uh, given that what you just described as, you know, sort of um, a high demand and low, you know, number of, of contractors, presumably, that would be able to do that work. So I'm assuming that there must be some sort of master plan somewhere that says you start in August or you start in September if you want to get work done in, you know, June of next year. So I just want to hear a little bit more about that. I think the community uh, would like to, to know that. And then also you mentioned um, the extra deep cleaning at all the buildings. Um, I know that there was also concern about pests last year. So we just, you know, if you don't mind uh, sharing a few more details about what those plans, you mentioned teams going, you know, that, that are sort of been assigned. If you can just describe what that looks like a little bit more, um, that would be really helpful. Cool, sure. So um, in terms of, of the optimal time for, um, uh, for paving and uh, blacktop work, I think we do need to get our scope prepared at the end of the summer, early fall. I'm going to defer once again to uh, Mr. Mooring's expertise in that matter, but I think that it's not something we can let wait until the winter to, to start moving. It's got to start right <coughs> away. Um, but the things that we're trying to get done this fall are going to trump that out. So end of July, hopefully, uh, scope of work and start making plans to get stuff done this fall, and then end of the summer, uh, try to start getting balls rolling for, for next spring, late spring, early summer. Uh, it's what I would expect. Um, if, does that answer that question? It, it kind of. Um, okay. I think, you know, and please excuse me for, for pushing on this, but I do think that it's important for uh, us to sort of assign ourselves some sort of deadline, right? To say, mm -hmm. you know, by the end of this summer, we want to have a very clear picture of when our bidding process will actually begin and sort of and have a plan in place for that. And I appreciate Superintendent Mooring's, uh, you know, being a partner in this and thinking about it. Um, I also would suggest that we might want to bring in some other, you know, folks, maybe perhaps from other districts who have experience with this or other towns. Um, I just think that, you know, given the, the competitive nature that you seem to be describing and that anecdotally mm -hmm. I've heard also repeated from other places, um, that we need to get a little aggressive with this if we actually want to get any of these projects off the ground next year. So I would appreciate hearing, you know, by our next meeting in August, um, just a sense from you about what that timeline looks like. That would be really helpful. Excellent. Yes. Um, I'll try to have some dates for you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, uh, part of the issue is, is really defining the scope of the work so that we can have an idea what kind of project we're looking at. Um, uh, so that's, we're still sort of in the planning stages, but I should have more information for you Great. the next meeting, not a problem. Um, uh, in terms of pests, we have an uh, integrated pest management uh, program in place for all of our schools. Uh, they do visit regularly, a uh, minimum of once a month. Um, and when issues arise, they come at least twice a month. Um, this has been our standard practice. The issue that we had, the issues that we had at uh, Wildwood uh, arose from the building being unoccupied for a prolonged period of time. And um, in, that's not going to be the case this summer. We have uh, folks in all the buildings and um, probably program happening in all the buildings as well uh, through our facilities rental uh, usage. Um, that's not quite yet finalized. Give me another couple of days and I can, I can tell you for sure. Um, uh, so in terms of, of teams, um, we, we've, we've got the custodial group shifting second shift uh, to first shift to uh, have a, a, a larger crew uh, to really go at stuff aggressively in a team. Uh, and we'll be also uh, looking forward to hiring some of our high school students to come in for, for summer help as well uh, on the deep cleaning. 
Um, and then we have our maintenance crew and some of our drivers doing work on um, some of the infrastructure for the buildings, um, specifically the, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, the air filters, uh, uh, the valves. We did a big deep cleaning last summer at Wildwood, the very end of the summer, um, uh, which held us back. We've done some deep cleaning of some of those units uh, at the other elementary schools uh, during vacations. We're going to have another go at it this summer. Uh, we'll be, you know, all the filters changed and, and all of the uh, unit ventilators cleaned deeply. Um, one of the ongoing issues with pests. Uh, is building access. Um, so we're also looking at ways to tighten up um, gaps that, that pests can come in through, uh, and that's part of my plan for this summer. Um, the other major issue for pests is uh, access to food and water. Uh, so we really want to try to keep tight control over how food is being used <coughs> in our summer programs uh, and make sure that we're keeping on top of cleaning that and getting the trash out of the building as quickly as we can. So that's, that's part of what's going on. Um, I'm not sure if I've convinced you that we have a plan, but. Um. Thank you, I appreciate the, the detail and you taking the time to, to explain that. It gives us a better picture, I think, of, of what's going on in those buildings this summer. And again, the community had expressed so much concern uh, last year, and rightfully so, mm. um, about the conditions when they returned to the buildings. And, you know, quite frankly, not just last summer, I think there's also been sort of a continuing problem. Um, so, it, you know, while it, 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 I feel good about uh, the, you know, renewed attention on, on some of this, um, it sounds like some of the ongoing pest issues and things like that have, have been ongoing. So it's, you know, I think it's worth uh, pushing on that as well and considering, Absolutely. you know, an aggressive plan. Yes, and so, um, and, and part of, um, uh, in terms of Wildwood, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting again with the staff there and talk about ways that we can form a team between facilities and folks working in the building to streamline the process and really jump on issues as they arise. Uh, and I'm hope, hoping that we can do that uh, early in the fall uh, since we didn't fit it in the spring. Thank you. Mr. Nakajima? You, you probably already have this thought through. But since the utilization of the schools is undoubtedly at a lower level during the summer, uh, even if no building is being fully shut down for the summer, that um, if you don't have them scheduled now, I would get whoever it is, Minuteman or whoever else is, your, is the pest control person, company for our, our district, uh, to come in, you know, like a week before <laughs> the staff starts coming back in August oh, and absolutely. do like a really, really thorough check uh, to make sure that we're on top of the, I mean, the last thing I would, I would want is for staff to come back in August, be prepping and saying, oh, you know, we really didn't think this would have happened again this fall. Uh, so since we, they come in every month anyway and are scheduled every month anyway, uh, I would just, you, we know when it is on the calendar now book them now and have them come in and do a really thorough check. I think that's a great suggestion. I'm going to check on their schedule and see if I can tweak that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay. So Dr. Well, Morris? Yep. So um, field update. So uh, I'll be brief to say that um, there are many organizations, the, uh, there's a couple regional athletic teams that use particularly the Fort River field. Um, and there's some community organizations that also use the fields, uh, more, most often Fort River for um, their athletics. Um, and so one of the concerns has been, that's been expressed is the use of the fields. Um, so right now it's a team. Uh, the DPW does some most of the heavy lifting in terms of mowing and and then Rupert's team does some of the kind of minor repair, um, our equipment in terms of the district's equipment, much better for hills. So if you think of Wildwood in particular, you can think of some hills that the DPW equipment can't manage, but in terms of mowing a large field, they have different equipment that's much stronger than ours. And, and what you'll hear next week at the region, just to share some thoughts, is we've been meeting actively, including this afternoon, with um, town staff and athletics department staff uh, about formalizing our structures of who takes care of what fields, who makes which decisions about field use, um, and one of the things that we're looking forward to 
in working with the town is clarifying a protocol of when fields can be used based on the field conditions, weather conditions, et cetera, uh, because what we know is that our fields are overused, right? There's no surprise there. That's not something that you haven't heard prior at the regional level, and I think that extends, you know, Fort River more than the other schools uh, in terms of overuse of fields. Frankly, some of the other fields like Crocker used to be used more, and it's, it's used much less by community organizations um, because it's really wet. Um, and Fort River definitely has wetness in its um, field use, but it has maintained more community use, formal community use. And so I think it'll, I don't want to preview too much of next week because it's crossing uh, a little bit, but I do want to acknowledge that there have been concerns expressed about the field use and we're working with the town to clarify a plan to better manage that. And it will take a lot of commitment from community partners. So um, we think about recess as being the primary function of the Fort River field for Fort River families and students. And yet after school is when the fields are getting the most intense usage um, and trying to clarify a protocol and actually someone who may say, no, I know you plan to be at Fort River to practice export in our determination professionally, no team should be practicing there and we're sorry. So, you know, the field stuff is gonna be, the preview is that uh, we're working with the town, I think we're making effective progress in clarifying protocols and yet it will invariably uh, inconvenience and um, frankly frustrate many people to have a closer management of field use and that extends to Fort River as well. Sorry, that's not a happy story, but I think it is what we need to do to maintain the primary purpose of the field, which is for Fort River students. Any questions or comments for the superintendent? Ms. Spitzer. Um, thank you for that update. I just wanted to add since you, um, you know, my son's at Wildwood and I was just there the other day for the um, end of the year picnic and all of the kids were playing soccer and it's not an official field, but it is currently just dirt. <laughs> and um, I know it's not one that gets used for team sports, but I, I do feel like it's in a real state of disrepair as well. Um, probably not a, as much of a priority because I know it's not used by other community organizations, but I just wanted to state for the record that that field could use some love and care too. As well as Crocker Farm for the opposite issue. Uh, generally, the drainage at Crocker Farm is a significant issue, and um, that's why community organizations have stopped using it, frankly, is because it doesn't drain particularly well. And on weeks like this where we're going to have a significant amount of rain, it's not a particularly playable surface. So I think you're right. I want to focus on Fort River um, because that's where some of the concerns have come, but I don't disagree. And yeah. I've, it's a little bit of grass and mostly dirt on that soccer field, and um, that's certainly the reality right now. So thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, I appreciate that. I, I think, you know, um, just on the, the last comment about uh, possible frustration that we'll hear from the community, I agree with you. I think that, you know, it's difficult for people to change their patterns of use, expectations, and all of that. Uh, at the same time, I think it would be really helpful to provide an alternative or some options for, for folks. Um, so it goes a lot better if we can say to them, you can't use this field today, but maybe you can try Groff Park or you can try some other, you know, some other place and, and checking with the town to see what is available um, or even across the districts. Um, because as we sort all of this out, it definitely will take flexibility on the part of, you know, the district, a part of the community uh, so that we can make those changes that are very much needed. Um, as Ms. Spitzer pointed out and so many other community members have pointed out repeatedly. Um, but I think, you know, again, much easier to be able to say to folks, you know, here are some other options, here are some plans, here's a schedule that, you know, that, that hopefully will, will meet your needs um, is better than if we just shut them out completely. Dr. Morris and Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I think the other piece at next week's meeting is we'll have the final report from Weston and Sampson. And while that's a regional agenda topic, it does look at all the fields across the town, including the fields at the elementary level. Um, so I think it will be worthwhile to have that discussion and to have their analysis of whether we currently have the right amount of playable fields for the demands of the town in general. And, and they have, in my opinion, some helpful, for the draft I saw, which is not the final one, uh, some helpful feedback about the use slash overuse of fields. Um, so more soon on that, but I just want to I appreciate that point of view, and I think the report will be helpful in contextualizing what alternatives are out there. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Demling. I, you know, I guess the, the one thought that is going through my mind as I'm hearing all these updates is, you know, I appreciate the additional attention, but I think the, the fact that our 
our facilities and, and our grounds are in not great shape should really come as no surprise to anybody in town. I, I, this is really a theme that courses throughout a lot of things in our town in that we have a lot of buildings and roads and, and places that uh, frankly are in significant need of capital investment. And our town over the years, over the decades, has not done a great job of taking care of things. And that's the sobering reality. And I, don't, I don't say that to depress people, but I think when we come to the table, whether it's at JCPC or whether it's to the town council, uh, whether it's talking about the school building project that hopefully is a result of the statement of interest, um, this is a sobering reality that I think is uh, part of our duty as school committee to help educate the public about, that we're in a significant capital situation in town and we're gonna have to make hard decisions and some of it is going to be frustration at not being able to use our facilities as frequently as, as we want to, and some of it is going to be accepting solutions that are not ideal, that are compromised solutions. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a thread that, that goes through everything that I think we all kind of understand and assume, but I think, you know, going forward, if we're conscious about educating as much of the public as possible, this is really a, a town-wide theme, uh, it, it would help in terms of uh, being, approaching all of these situations in as collaborative a way as possible. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I agree with what Mr. Dumling just said, I'll, but I, I'd add on to that that one of the themes that um, has arisen in the last couple of years that have been on JCPC has sometimes been that we have legacy institutional practices about how we deal with um, fields and buildings and facilities that um, may, may be utilized by one department but is technically owned by another department or something like that. And so there is a sort of an existing practice of not, not necessarily identifying a responsible party who has you know, the, the, the accountability and authority to manage appropriately the utilization, and maintenance, and improvements of a facility. And, and it, it, our athletic, in the case, in this case, our athletic fields are only one example of it. There are other examples. But I think this is one of those things where you can go a long time by just having sort of a small town ethos of, you know, two people talking over the fence, you know, or to, from one cubicle to the other about, hey, do you think you can get the mowers over there next week? Oh, sure, no problem. And there's no problem, right? But then as things get more complex and the utilization gets more intense and the capital needs get more intense, you know, then over time, the ability to, to really appropriately manage, who to know who to say no to, how to organize the information so it's really transparent and fair and the rules are fair and then prioritize investments, it's much harder to do. And so the point is, this is one of those areas that screams, and I'm, I'm talking, I'm not talking about the region now because I'm being appropriate. Um, my point is, this, this is short for River. Let me start to pick on for River again. But it's an area where you know you already have non for River school-based um, athletic activity going on there, which is great, that's fine. But the bottom line is then you have, you have mixed sort of jurisdictions and responsibilities around who's really responsible for managing this field, who's managing the utilization, and, who's do, who's, and then who's responsible for paying in to fix it, right? And I don't really think that, I don't think that's serving as well right now. And I think it's breaking things down, and, we, and it's something that really needs significant attention. And I hope in another meeting in a few days, I guess around a week, um, I, I, if we don't hear about that as a topic for solution, I'm going to bring it up again because it's, it's, it, it, the reality is the money doesn't get any better, as Mr. Dumbling was suggesting, which means we need, and then, and then you can't be willy-nilly about how you make decisions about people need to know that their interests are being treated as fairly as someone else's and that they have access to decision makers that's really transparent and the rules of the game are fair, no pun intended. And so, and you're, you're not going to get that unless you have that kind of uh, joint agreement between the town and the school district and uh, allow the decision-making authority and money to follow in some manner um, that, that uh, practice. Ms. McDonald? I, I just have a question, and if it's not appropriate, just I'll, I'll zip it for next week. But um, uh, you mentioned the, that you're coordinating across with the athletic department and the town and the district are working together on this. Do you also have representation from the various um, youth sports organizations that, that utilize the field? 
I'm, and I'm asking because I think it might be helpful to have those voices at the table when it does come down to sort of parsing out scarce resources. So what, let's say this. So those organizations typically go through, with, with, I can think of one exception that's not relevant for the elementary level, they typically go through LSSC in terms of field usage, and LSSC has been part of the planning. So I think there's a lot of communication loops that have to go back to those organizations, but for anyone who uses outdoor sports, let's say, um, indoor sports is different. Um, LSC, LSSC, even if it's not an LSSC sport, has a role in the scheduling and field usage right, uh, of those, and, and that's been the connection. And so LSSC themselves uses the fields a lot, but they're also the connection, the conduit to the youth organiza athletic organization. Okay, I'm going to move us on because uh, we still have a couple of pretty weighty topics on the agenda. But thank you again, Mr. Roy Clark, for your presentation, for being here tonight, and for all your work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is school choice update. Sure. Dr. Morris. So, some. Yeah, actually, um, I think it is a happier topic. Um, <laughs> So just the backstory is on early May, got a memorandum from this DESE from uh, Department of Education that our prior model of school choice students who enter the municipal elementary district, like Amherst, who then would feed into the regional secondary district, there was a change in practice or legal guidance actually. So formerly those students, once you were entering in in kindergarten or whatever grade level a student came through choice, the Amherst Elementary Schools, it meant that they would then travel with their cohort to the regional school district without any delay or complication. The legal guidance actually flipped that and said that it would grandfather in current school choice students, but starting next year, school choice students would then um, have to re-enter a school choice lottery to get into the regional school district at seventh grade and that there was no advantage to having been an Amherst Elementary School student throughout their educational career. Uh, worked with um, the th chairs of three committees, so two of which are at this meeting, also the Pelham School Committee chair, um, provided some advocacy both um, legislatively um, in terms of our elected officials, but also with DESE, had multiple conversations with them. And uh, what I appreciate both about the elected officials, Ms. Ms. Ordonez and I and, and Ms. Hall met with um, the representative from Senator Comerford's office, uh, was their responsiveness. It was very clear that this was purely a legal guidance. They looked at the Mass General Law, and I will say our attorney for our district and me, and I'm not a lawyer, agreed that the old guidance probably was inconsistent with, it, with Mass General Law. So this wasn't a policy change from DESE. It was clearly, you know, it was their general counsel looking at guidance that was issued in 1995 around school choice, saying this doesn't match what was in the law. So um, through that advocacy today, I had a conference call that included um, the associate commissioner, Jeff Wolfson, and, and other DESE staff members about a process moving forward. And without getting too deep into the weeds, unless the committee would like me to, um, it'll be a larger topic at the regional school committee level. Uh, what um, the suggested workaround that doesn't involve a legislative change is to work on an agreement that would need to be voted at the regional school committee uh, that would allow elementary school choice students from member communities to tuition in to the regional school um, district. There's language around tuition in at the same rate as school choice students with the special ed increment included. So essentially it would not be continuing them as school choice, they would be technically tuitioned into the school, um, but the regional school committee could make that determination and um, it wouldn't actually, so this is an update, this isn't an action step for the Amherst Elementary School. Um, it'll be a regional topic, but it's certainly relevant as this is currently you voted to continue to be a school choice district. Uh, I think I've shared that we've communicated with you know, school choice applicants, and what DESE suggested at the end of the phone conference call today was that they would actually draft language for us of what that would look like that would be consistent with how their reading of Mass General Law and tuition in agreements is, and send it to us for our acknowledgement review, and then it would be a topic for the regional school committee to review and potentially vote on sometime in the future. Um, but what it would do is, from the individual student family level, 
it would actually maintain the current practice that has been the case since 1995. Well, we were in a choice district then, but has been the, the case since the region has been a regional, uh, been a school choice district in the elementaries uh, through a different mechanism. Um, so I want to say publicly, I greatly appreciate both the work of Senator Comerford and frankly, the flexibility of DESE staff uh, and the responsiveness. I mean, mm -hmm. this advocacy, usually advocacy you anticipate, and I know this is a topic that you all have lived in different ways. You think of it in, in order of magnitude of, of months and years and not weeks. And my experience on this one is they've been uh, more responsive than I could have thought and actually got off the phone today and say, how do I acknowledge that um, when this all hopefully plays out well and how do I let the Board of Education know about um, their understanding, their interest in understanding the implications for a district that uh, had not been part of the change that was presented was purely a legal one. So that's my summary. is a little longer than I thought, sorry. Um, but summary of where we are as it relates to choice and the results of the advocacy. I want to thank all of you for promoting me or allowing me to, you know, and supporting me in my advocacy on this topic. And I just want to say, uh, Dr. Morris, I actually think you're being a little too modest uh, in the description of this because, honestly speaking, I think, you know, we had our meeting with Senator Comerford's staff and, and uh, they were wonderful. Um, Senator Comerford certainly has supported this and acted, you know, quickly on this. But I think it's also your relationship with Desi staff uh, that allowed this to move as quickly as it did um, through that, that pipeline. Um, because I think, you know, had we not had that kind of a relationship with the state organization that uh, we may not have seen resolution this quickly. And so, you know, it went from a, you know, sort of uh, accidental, you know, uh, error that they made um, to now them taking steps to want to correct that. And I think it's great that they are willing to draft language even for us that we could use um, that just shows, you know, how they're going above and beyond, but really appreciate the work that you put into that. Okay, uh, if there are no questions on school choice, we will move on to the superintendent evaluation. Um, so I, just a couple of words and then I'm looking at Mr. Demling to see if there's anything else that maybe he might want to add. Uh, so in front of you is a memo, draft memo that uh, I and Mr. Demling prepared for this committee. Uh, that is the summative evaluation of Dr. Morris as superintendent of this district. Uh, it is based on the evaluations, individual evaluations that were submitted by four of our uh, committee members. Um, so that was me, Mr. Demling, Ms. McDonald, and Ms. Spitzer. And our fifth member of our committee was unable to complete this, uh, this evaluation, not because he did not want to, not to put words in your mouth, but I'm pretty sure that's true, um, but because he was out of the country and uh, attending some uh, family, urgent family matters. And so, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, I hope the committee has had a chance to review the summative evaluation. Uh, in it is basically uh, in very similar style, uh, identical style actually from the, the format that we used last year. Uh, there is a narrative section that sort of explains some of the highlights of what we gleaned from the individual evaluations. And then there's the charts that break down, uh, you know, kind of the data that we receive from the individual evaluations. Um, I want to once again thank Mr. Demling for the work that he put into putting together those charts. They were very helpful. Um, but we would try to, you know, fairly, hopefully fairly, uh, pull the, the highlights again, both negative and positive from the individual evaluations, just to try to give them most, the most comprehensive uh, review that we could uh, for both the superintendent and the community. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I think that the committee has expressed a great deal of satisfaction with the superintendent's work this past year, um, you know, expressed confidence in, in his ability to continue to lead the district. Uh, there were several highlights that were, that were you know, uh, continuously brought up in the individual evaluations around consensus building, uh, you know, a focus on social justice work and um, the professional development that goes with that. Um, and then also his leadership and vision in guiding the school improvement plans and in the district's first language, uh, dual language program, which we just talked about some more tonight, but have been talking about throughout this past year. Uh, so all of that really points to an incredible body of work uh, for this superintendent and for this district. And um, I will give a chance for you know, each of our uh, committee members to, to you know, uh, include their comments if they, if they so choose um, and to, to make their comments to 
uh, to Dr. Morris and to the rest of the committee, and including, uh, I had invited Mr. Nakajima since he was not able to actually uh, do a formal evaluation if he wanted to share some thoughts and some comments. But before I do that, uh, Mr. Demling, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add on this process uh, for the committee. Um, no, I don't think process-wise. Um, I think you did a good job writing up the narrative <laughs> summaries of, of the individual comments. Um, it, I think it's always challenging to express that in a qualitative way that's publicly understandable given how technical um, the instructor, the superintendent rubric as we call it, <laughs> gets. Um, I, I think to, to me the core take home point if you're trying to interpret and understand this document is, is that the, the ratings, you know, you have like the four ratings, right? Unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient and exemplary and proficient it's, you, you, there's a tendency to think of that as maybe like a B or like okay, but the actual language is fully satisfactory, the rigorous expected level of performance. And that's where all four uh, evaluators came down on uh, with the overall performance rating. So I think that's, it's, it's really, uh, I think our district should feel um, great that we have a superintendent who's able to achieve that level of performance. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there process wise. So um, I guess we can maybe go down this way. Okay. So it gives Mr. Nakajima a chance to, to say what he wanted to say, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> well, um, first thing I want to do is just apologize for not submitting uh, the evaluation. Uh, I, this is, um, it's my fault at looking at the submittal deadline is June 8th. And since I was due to be back in the United States on June 6th, I thought, hey, I'll just do it June 7th while I'm heavily jet lagged. Who cares? Uh, and then as to add, I had a major family emergency in Japan that re prevented me from coming back until uh, just a couple days ago. So I apologize for that. Um, I've read through this. Uh, I agree. I agree. I know that there's some variation uh, within within specific elements, but I, I'm prepared to vote for it. And I also agree uh, with uh, the colleagues on the school committee. Um, there, without going into it, I think most of the things I thought were met. Some there was significant progress, um, and, and I think that echoes sort of the, the, the range of responses uh, that were in here. I think one of the observations I would make generally, uh, and I think it comes through in the school improvement plans, it comes through in the work that um, you've done to develop uh, a capital improvement plan for the elementary schools, is I think uh, this year, more even more than last year, I think you've made significant advances in your sort of syncretic or integrative practice of balancing both um, your desire to have an, an inquiry and research-based sort of practice, evidence-based, you know, based on research evidence, practice and approach, with also the human art of working with various constituencies uh, and, and staff to try to uh, rec to recognize that no good ideas or good ideas are developed absent a group setting. And to do that, it means you're engaging stakeholders at multiple levels. It includes things like the family engagement elements that are in here. And even more, even more than last year, I think there's lots of evidence in both, in literally what you submitted as well as the practical experience we've had during the year in which um, you've, you've improved your ability to create a good collaborative leadership team, both in central office, within the elementary schools, understand how to, where, where to lead and where to also delegate, while also developing a significantly improved um, sense of vision and direction and purpose around how we're working. So it's something that um, I just, I was, I was, I, I hate to say this, I was actually literally thinking about this today. Um, so I was thinking about the way, in, and we talked about this earlier in some meeting, about the way in which you're deploying the earlier than expected release time this year and the professional development work and the way in which resources, the work of the team, uh, aligning professional development to strategic objectives for next year, how all these things lined up. And what really struck me about the quality of that work was actually that the quality of that work wouldn't occur unless you'd figured out how to even improve upon your ability as a superintendent to know how to work effectively with others in a team setting in which you have, for better or for worse, you signed up to have the educational leader role. So it means you have a central role in that process, and yet the reality is you're never going to be effective unless you can figure out how to animate 
other people to then provide their own leadership effectively. And I just see, I see you doing an even better job of that. I struggle with the provi proficient exemplary thing. Uh, I agree with the proficient uh, uh, recommendation of my four colleagues. I'd also say you're risking becoming exemplary. If you, if you, keep, uh, if you keep at this, you're gonna actually force us to give you an exemplary rating, um, but you're gonna have to earn it. You're gonna have to earn it, which means to me continuing, like we talked about this last year, continuing to apply yourself along these different areas, either the goals we set or the personal and professional development goals, but I'm just pleased that you, that you can, there's progress both in the practical evidence of what we've done this year and the goals that were set, but there's also, I think, in terms of the ethos and the praxis and the environment, there's also there evidence we can sense in the relationship that we see between you and your, your colleagues and in the community of this improvement as well, and that's great. Things aren't perfect, but it's, that's great. So thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna skip my turn and um, hand it over to Ms. Spitzer. Sure. If there's any comments? Um, I wanna thank um, the chair and Mr. Dumbling for putting this together. Thank you guys. Um, it's very easy to read, just like last year. Um, and I guess I just wanna echo a lot of what's been said already, but just that I think we set a lot of the goals are long-term and sustained, and I think that's the way it should be. And I think if we continue on the, I guess what I want to say is I think you've really done a good job of laying the groundwork for a lot of these, hopefully, things like um, a capital plan and the physical environment to improve over time. I think if we can continue with the you know, direction we're going in with both the schools creating their own plans and then the regional planning, all of the planning that's happening right now is really, fruit, hopefully, will be fruitful. And hopefully, we can get to that point where we can check the exemplary box or um, click it this digital age, but um, <laughs> anyways, thank you, and, um, and I'll leave it at that. Ms. McDonald. Um, I'll also express thanks at, at, um, to you both for compiling this excellent document, because I struggled even just completing the survey, <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was late, <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to get mine in late. Um, I, I, I won't repeat things that um, my colleagues have said, but I share a lot of those same sentiments. Um, and I think the thing that um, I do uh, not, um, not, haven't heard this already, but um, none of us is perfect, and, and including yourself. Um, and I think um, what, I, what I tried to call out in here and what I was thinking about as I, as I um, completed the survey was that as long as, as long as an individual is willing to take feedback, get input, and work collaboratively, that overcomes any of our imperfections. And I think that I, I really see, um, not only would I rate you as exemplary on that, but also I find it inspirational for myself and in, in sort of how I can approach my own work and other, other things that I do too. So I do, wanna, I do wanna point that out because I do think that that is an exceptional strength that you bring to your work and to the district and that we all benefit, not, not, um, you know, not just the students and the staff, but also the entire community. So thank you. Mr. Dowling. Yeah, I feel like I could just say plus one, plus one, plus one, <laughs> everything everybody's saying. Um, I mean, it's, as a school committee, I think it's very fortunate um, that we have a superintendent that we feel very confident we can work with and that, that I feel is an excellent fit for our district. Um, you know, like Ms. McDonald said, not, nobody's perfect, um, but I think, I think we would, as a town and as a school committee, we would be hard pressed to replace someone at the same level of quality and productivity as, as, um, as what you've shown us the last couple of years. I, th I think in this year in particular, hopefully, knock on wood, you know, we can look back at years from now as this was the year of dual language, and that will be a big smile on our face. And that this was the year of the compromise proposal for the school building project that, again, major knock on wood, the statement of interest gets accepted and that process executes. Um, those are two massive things that could have incredible benefit going forward. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I really think those are, those are excellent highlights. Um, you know, as you're reading through the details of the individual evaluations and the summative evaluation, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the um, evaluative instrument is, is just structured that it's not going to ever be an ideal thing. And I always, and we've talked about this before, so I won't like re re belabor the point, um, but this idea of what are you evaluating on and when you're asked to evaluate goals, how specifically 
should you respond to what's specifically articulated as the described benchmark? I, th I think I, I um, had the most struggle with this when I was evaluating uh, diversity of teaching staff. I think as expressed in terms of uh, new hires representing a higher percentage persons of color than the current staffing percentages, uh, I think the data you provided shows that that was clearly met uh, um, and was, was over met. Um, and so uh, that means exceeded, and, and yet monitoring and increasing the diversity of our staff is never something that we should not pay attention to going forward, right? And so you want to sort of balance those two things. Anyway, that's more of a, a meta point. Um, but yeah, I just, wanted, I just wanted to thank the superintendent for, for an excellent year of work. Um, I, I, uh, I would echo Mr. Nakajima's se sentiments of a lot of these things. I feel like you're on the proficient exemplary fence. Um, and and uh, uh, Mr. Nakajima said it much better than I did about how uh, weaving those two threads of that research evidence and the, the human art of engagement, I think you've really done an exceptional job with. And so knowing that you have that approach to problems and you've fostered an excellent working relationship with the school committee, I think means that whatever problems expected or unexpected come down in the future, we can feel confident as, as a town and as a community that you'll, you'll be up to the challenge to, to taking on. So, so thank you again for, for our very productive and beneficial year. So uh, I also uh, don't want to belabor the, the point, but absolutely in agreement with all of the, the things that my colleagues have said. Um, I think that you have done an incredible job of showing us all what an open door policy actually is. Um, for a, you know, any executive leader that is in any organization or company or school district or government uh, body to truly take the time to listen to, you know, every constituent who is, you know, sends an email, makes a phone call, asks for some, some of your time, uh, that is really a, a remarkable thing. Um, and it's, it's not something that I think we often take the time to appreciate um, because it helps in so many different ways. Not only are you showing your openness to hearing different points of view and perspectives, but also I think uh, taking that time to acknowledge that you may not have all the answers and that our community has a lot to say and that's a good thing. Um, and even though you may not always agree with all of us all the time, <laughs> Uh, the fact that you're still willing to, you know, accept all of that input and feedback throughout the course of the year and give us an opportunity to, to share our thinking with you is a sign of a true leader. Um, and I really appreciate that and thank you for that, um, probably above all. But I think also just to echo what we heard, um, the individual evaluations uh, definitely pointed to some very remarkable gains, um, you know, dual language program, which is historic for our community, something that has been tried in the past and we weren't able to achieve, um, you know, the work that has gone into uh, putting together a comprehensive, you know, capital plan. And even though I express my frustration and have done so in meetings and, you know, in my individual evaluation, uh, will continue to put pressure on not just the superintendent, but I think all of us uh, to continue to do better on that front understanding the importance of healthy environments and buildings for our students and for our staff. Um, this is the first time that I've seen an actual capital plan being put together. And so I think, you know, we're sort of at that threshold of a uh, very positive change. And um, I think we have to thank Dr. Morris for that work and for his team for, you know, for, for all of that. Um, and then finally, I think the work that we have done uh, as a district together and that the community has helped lead, but also Dr. Morris, uh, with your support and the team that you have put together to focus us so, so deeply on uh, social justice and racial equity um, that has carried through, you know, both through your assistant superintendent's work, but also just, you know, the, the, um, the professional development work that's gone on with educators and staff throughout the, you know, the, the entire district, uh, and not just this district, but the other two districts that you oversee, uh, but since we're talking about this one specifically, you know, I, I really want to commend you for that. I think that it's uh, an aspiration and a vision that we have had and held close to our hearts, um, and it's great to see that work actually finally getting put, you know, not just coming off the ground, but actually starting to, to fly. So thank you for that. I think it also has been an excellent year. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, the next year and hopefully many more uh, of your work, continuing work with that.
And just a note um, on this you know, process, again, I think just as a reminder for the community that may be either just tuning in or maybe watching this later on, uh, the evaluation is based on this summative evaluation, which is the you know, official uh, position that we should be voting on, hopefully tonight, uh, with the committee's approval, um, is the official position of the committee, but also represents you know, several independent uh, individual evaluations, as well as an, a very broad and lengthy document that Dr. Morris put together uh, that included evidence for all of the work uh, that has gone on in the past year. And all of that is part of the public record. Uh, I encourage people, we had a very robust conversation about this at our last meeting, um, about how that document actually shows such an incredible breadth of work that's taken place in the district, not just by Dr. Morris, but by you know all of the administrators and staff and educators in the district, and really is something um, worth reviewing and taking time. And again, I don't think all of us are going to agree with everything that's in there. Um, and there's you know uh, probably some places where we could make improvements in many different ways, but it really is it gives a, a great picture of, of the district's work to date. So um, I highly encourage people to take a look at that. So with that, um, I'm assuming, unless Dr. Morris, there's anything that you want to add in response um, or if you have any questions for the committee. My preference would be if I could share remarks after you vote. I just think that'd probably be the right procedure. On that. Sounds good, okay. <laughs> so uh, with the committee's permission, uh, I'm assuming that we might be ready for a vote on this memo given the comments that we've just heard. Um, so I will take a motion if anyone is so moved. <laughs> Mr. Nakajima? Move to approve as presented the 2018-2019 superintendent evaluation memo. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. Uh, any further comments, questions? Okay. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I did have a couple of things I'd like to share. Um, thank you for that feedback, not just the positive feedback, but the, the feedback more generally. Um, probably Sasha's watching this enjoying it because she knows this is probably super uncomfortable for me because this is not my uh, uh, cup of tea, so to speak. Um, but I really do take all the words you shared to heart and thank you. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to comment after you voted um, is I want to really acknowledge your work in support of the district because as, as you noted with the artifacts document, it's about the work of the district, right? So I'm not everywhere. I don't do many of the tasks that matter the most for kids. But what really matters for, I think, for our organization is that we actually have a leadership team, and I'm including you know, the school committee as, as a key part of that, um, that actively advocates and works together to support the organization. And I do feel very supported in that way. Um, one term that when I first started in the role is acting in an interim that I use a lot. Uh, one of my goals was about promoting psychological safety of staff. So some of you may not be as familiar with that. I won't go into the details now if you Google it. Uh, so well-known um, researcher, she's at Harvard, who coined the term. And what it really, what they found is in any organization, this has been studied a little more in the business world than education, although that's shifting, uh, having a structure in place where um, professionals um, can gather feedback, critical feedback, can take risks, um, kind of a honest, honest, candid conversations that are actually about the goals of the organization and not about the individual personalities. That's the highest functioning organizations. Um, you know, for instance, Google did a self-assessment of their own organization. They found that was the number one factor in their highest performing teams was folks who felt psychological safety. So that term sometimes can, you know, people perceive it as a soft term. It's actually not at all. It's actually, can you actually have honest conversations? Can you share honest feedback? And, and that it's always about the goals of the organization. It's not about anything else. And I think this, in my experience, this committee really models that well, and, and I think I've tried to partner with you all on that. And that matters for the people who are presenting tonight and the people who are doing the work that uh, as we're gathering feedback, dual example, dual language is a great example. So that program's better because of the questions that were asked, because of the presentations that were requested to push us to think differently about the work. And it wasn't that any of you necessarily need to be dual language experts uh, or, or read as much research as Ms. Richardson and myself. But you know, the lottery is a great example of a place where without that feedback, we would not have gotten to the place where we have a lottery. And to date, knock on wood, 
No one's come to say it was unfair, it's unjust, it's not connected to the goals of the district. You know, it's not that we don't have talented people working on that, but without that community-infused feedback and support along the way and the questions you asked, we wouldn't have landed in that place. And so when we think about the health, and I think all of us are feeling very optimistic about the, the, where our organization is headed, I really do want to, it sounds weird to say in the tail end of an evaluation, but it, there's no <coughs> other good time to talk about this. Um, I do really want to acknowledge that what I feel like is, um, I'm not going to use a rating category because that would be weird. I realize that there's double meanings of words. So I've appreciated the way that the committee has partnered with each other and with me and, and district staff to promote what we all want for kids. So I want to really say thank you. I think the other piece, I think Amy Edmondson is the author, if anyone's really curious about looking up psychological safety. Thanks. So the other piece that when I think to transition, I know our next topic is going to FY20, but on a personal level, this isn't about the district organization um, or like, you know, district more generally, it's really about me and, and some goals I'm thinking about. One of the things on the staff evaluation, the 360 degree part of it, that I know I need to improve next year and I've been actively thinking about structures to help myself improve is now that we have strategic plans for the elementary schools, we have a lot of things, right, what was the word that was used, lofty goals. Um, earlier, um, there, was a, there was a distinction in the feedback from the folks I evaluate on accessibility versus observing practice. So in terms of accessibility, those rankings were much higher than it was in terms of, you know, that I was observing practice. And that really needs to change next year. Not, I mean, for the better, not like I'll be less accessible. But, um, and, um, and that's something that I'm actively talking about, you know, I've been talking to, you know, the chair about, and, and, and that's certainly something, whether it's in my formal goals from the school committee, my own personal goals, doesn't really matter. Uh, but it is something that as we make these ambitious plans that we have, um, being accessible is one thing, but being present to directly observe the work as it's in progress is something that, not that the ratings were terrible on that, I mean, it's a public document, anyone can look at it, uh, but they weren't where I want them to be, and they were accurate. So the people I was evaluating, I think, accurately displayed that that was not the strength of my performance in this year. And I think because of where we are organizationally, um, I know that's something I need to work on next year, and uh, that's easier to say, but actually I, I think, you know, actively thinking about the structures of my work at the elementary level and where we are, um, you know, being present isn't so much a challenge. I'm in the schools pretty frequently, but what I'm doing, um, I think that's the piece that needs to change. I do a lot of supervision, working with principals, trying to build capacity, which can't change, but being actually in classrooms, observing how things are going, talking to principals to build our, our collective capacity uh, to make sure these ambitious plans uh, get implemented with fidelity and to support our students is something that I'm actively thinking about. Um, so I know that's a preview a little bit, but you know that's not necessarily like an agenda topic perhaps for the school committee as we think about agenda topics for FY20. But in my own self-evaluation of my work, that's um, an area, and perhaps the, the area for me that I feel like I need to uh, improve uh, most significantly as we head to next year. So just, I wanted to share some reflections on that. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, and thank you for the, the preview as well. I mean, I think that that is definitely a, a great jumping off point for our next agenda items, but also it sets a good tone for the, our very last meeting of this school year uh, for this body anyway. Um, so if there are no further comments or thoughts from the committee, I would like to move us on to the FY20 uh, school committee planning, which is our next agenda item. Um, with an eye to the clock to say that we we're about 20 minutes past where I had hoped we would be at this point, but we also had some technical difficulties and some uh, important questions, so that is okay. Um, but I do want to keep us moving. So uh, in your packet, you should have a list of uh, dates for future school committee meetings. Uh, these include all of the, the, both the Amherst and Region Pella meetings. Um, so obviously this body is just looking at the Amherst meetings. Um, but these are the proposed dates for, for the next calendar year. Um, but I think more than just the dates themselves, we're looking for some guidance on, from the committee on uh, topics that we'd like to, be, to, to be, have brought back. Um, you know, any issues that you see arising 
uh, I think the superintendent and I try to sit fairly regularly to go through what we think should be on the next uh, you know, topics for discussion for the committee, uh, but would certainly appreciate hearing some now if there are things that you think we need to prioritize over the upcoming year uh, in addition to the things that we've already talked about, such as like capital planning stuff. So uh, perhaps we'll start from this direction. Mr. Dumling, do you want to take sure, a shot at that? Sure. Um, with, with the, uh, so I guess first just process question. So um, if, if things occur to us later, hopefully not much later, but <laughs> in the coming days and weeks and such. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. I'm sorry, Mr. Gemling, I'm just teasing. What will be the best way to Yes, to, to this share. is not your only opportunity yeah, to share, okay. absolutely. Okay, so we can email you and Dr. Morris. Okay, great. Um, so just a few examples. Um, if, if I think about, you know, the past year and sort of emerging things, um, this, this notion of breakfast after the bell and, um, and more broadly increasing student access to food <coughs> that has this amazing nexus of being more beneficial to students and financially advantageous the more we grow the <laughs> is just such an amazing uh, rare overlap to me that it, it seems like something that should be really pursued. Now, we, we saw that there's implementation challenges, you know, uh, not the least of which is, you know, food attracts rodents at, at Wildwood. So um, that's the kind of thing that would take, I think, a little more broad planning, but um, th there's a few topics that have that get the community really excited when I, um, whenever I talk to people. And this, this farm to school connection with that, the, the literal roots of the valley, right? <laughs> but where, where, you know, the book of the plow, right? With the, the, where this agricultural uh, themed um, place, um, I just think is, is pretty great. Um, so that, that's something I'd like to have sort of more clarified in terms of like, what, what do we do in terms of initiatives? Um, certainly if the statement of interest comes back positive in December, that's going to take a lot of our attention. And unlike this year, we have an opportunity to pre-plan for that a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels that if we are accepted, that we want to proceed as expeditiously as humanly possible given the urgency of the situation. And that is no easy feat given that it's going to be a building project of a lot of people and a lot of meetings. And um, so I think that that is something that could take um, some, some good forethought. Um, and, and, and the least articulated sort of focus that, that I, I would love to hear some more suggestions from you on are just this notion of, this emerging notion of emotional well-being as this foundational undercurrent over a lot of what we do. We heard a, a lot of this from the school improvement plans tonight. And um, it's, it's a funny compliment to see the, the strategies um, at the elementary level sort of go from this ground up where we're, and, and then where the end point is kind of a district level strategy at the region, you know, we sort of, we did the strategic planning from the opposite direction. So sort of seeing the end results of those three school improvement plans, and then taking a step back during the summer from your vantage point and saying, okay, what are the common themes here of things that you can work on as a, a district wide initiative maybe, uh, that would tie in and support the, the various things going on? Because as the principals mentioned, you know, they, they don't operate in a silo, and the more that they're able to cross pollinate, the better. And so. Those are just some initial thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Dumling. Ms. McDonald, do you have any thoughts? And don't feel, please don't feel pressured either. I mean, if, honestly, because I know this is, is sort of sprung on the, it's an agenda item, but it wasn't, you know, it, it, we're not putting, trying to put anybody on the spot. Yeah. Um, I, I would echo a lot of what Mr. Dumling said, and I don't really, I haven't really put a lot of thought into it, but one thing that just popped into my head is, as I was listening to you, and I don't know if this elevates to major topics for us to be addressing in the next school year, um, but I do think we need to come back to the question of um, expanded preschool access. Um, that, that's when we touched on, touched on again, um, but I think you know, it would be helpful to continue to talk about that. Um, and understand the progress that's been made in some of the initiatives that you undertook this year. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer? Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to confirm that housing and specifically the issue around homelessness students, I mean, that's on the, that was on the agenda and I think will be in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's adding as much as just making sure we don't let it drop. Um, and then I, I think just because this keeps coming up, the issues around, um, you know, we, we've stated as a goal the diversity of the staff, and, and I want to make sure that um, we maybe also tie that maybe to a conversation about licensing and just make sure that we're staying on track with that. Um, 
And then um, with all of this planning um, and setting of metrics of ways that we're going to be tracking things, I and the data is too vague, but I, I think it's important that somehow we build into our meetings a way to sort of um, see if we're making progress on the goals that were stated both in the school improvement plans and then in any um, larger planning that's happening in the district. And so if we can find a way to formalize that in our um, calendar, that might be good. Or um, maybe we need a subcommittee. I, I, don't, I don't know. But it's mm -hmm. something that's, I think, as we make these plans, we want to make sure we hold ourselves accountable. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? And that's a big conversation. Um, and then just, again, with the potential for um, this hopefully positive statement of interest, <laughs> um, it seems like it's an opportunity when we're talking about the built environment and how we're building our schools. It, it really opens up, I think, an opportunity to think about ways of bringing the farms to the schools or ways of bringing uh, project-based learning. And so I, I don't know if there's any learning we can do by looking at um, outside of our own district to think about how other schools have kind of been really creative about um, that. But that is only if we actually have a successful statement of interest. Dr. Morris, did you want to say So homelessness has really been uh, planned um, at the regional level, oh, well, we and, and I, I was going to actually acknowledge that um, I think my experience is it functions quite differently when the kids are younger, um, and it's more prevalent right now in our district when students are younger. So uh, I do think you know if the committee wants to pursue that, sometimes because the two committees can meet, or we just feel like we get it at you know we talk about a region. But I actually think there's a particular different set of scenarios at the elementary level related to homelessness that would make it worthy of, even if we're doing it at both committees, um, to do that. Great. I'm gonna skip myself for now, Mr. Nakajima. Sure, so uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reinforce some of the things that have been brought up that maybe do come at it at a slightly different angle. I, I think that, uh, A, I think that since we've been presented three school improvement plans, one of the things I want to make sure we're doing is that we're talking about those plans next year and we're having follow-up on them substantively. I mean, I think my colleagues have already been expressing that, but I'm just sort of putting it bluntly that what I don't, in a certain sense, if one of the, if, if, if the, between the chair and, and the superintendent and the principals, they came up with other things they wanted to highlight, I'm not even sure I care as long as it's considered important and follows their plan. Um, Oh, but along with that, I would say that because there was a common theme of family engagement, um, embracing the diversity of our students, which could mean any number in, in creating a welcoming environment and thinking about the emotional, social emotional well-being of students, um, this is no fault of the plans, but because they were setting goals without a context of what kind of experiences are families having now. What kind of, what are the differentiated experiences of students that they're having now? If there's a sense, I mean, and I, forgive me for putting it this way, because this probably sounds wrong. <laughs> like, we tend to talk about our schools in a purely celebratory manner, but nobody would say we need, nobody would ever say, we need to really, really improve and sort of close the last gap or mile on embracing students of all backgrounds and making them feel welcome, unless there was some sense there was a problem definition, right, that we weren't fully doing the job right. Um, now, and that all families weren't feeling that way now. And so, and, and I think that this is an environment which as you were saying earlier about wanting to do a better job observation in, in implementing the plans, I think that's critical because on some level, some of the elements that were most focused by Crocker, uh, Wildwood, and Fort River are goals that are amorphous to get what the data would be that would say most meaningfully that you've actually obtained that objective. Um, and it's, so it's, so uh, the observation, I think, just spot on, that the observational element is critical to at least using your professional judgment to say, oh, I think I see it when I see it, or I don't see it when I'm looking. Um, but anyways, I think we, my point is, I, what I'd love to see is better definition around how to bring that topic back, uh, those, in our topics, embracing the diversity of our district. I think this actually includes um, uh, homeless children and families, because they're part of the diversity of our district and the differentiated experience of students who may or may not feel fully engaged and welcome. Um, so I don't think it's a different thing. Uh, I also think that we should, uh, echoing something that, that uh, the chair said earlier, 
I think that if we really have the objective of making a substantial progress on capital improvement goals next year, then we need to hit that hard early in the year as specifically as possible. Um, and I think, I think it's good pressure to put on um, all of us. But I mean, but I, I frankly, I, I, I said this out of meeting, um, last meeting, so I'll say it in meeting this time. I still found the presentation to be slightly amorphous, and I get that's because some of the plans need to be coordinated with other departments, and we're not sure how it goes, but the bottom line is if you're trying to communicate to the public that, you, that you're gonna use scarce dollars well, uh, in, in a reasonably expeditious fashion to improve the capital environment of that your staff and students and families are experiencing, then I don't really, f I don't have that vibe yet that I know what's actually gonna have between, happen between this now and December and now and next May. And the only way we're gonna get that is if we have agenda items that early in the year that are then followed up on that are really task oriented, which is sort of a partner to Mr. Demling and others comments earlier about um, the school, the uh, SOI, right? Like we already sort of know that if we get accepted, then there's going to be a whole process we need to think through to hit that really well. Well, the same thing's true on this too. So, so uh, I, I don't want to echo what's been said. I agree with the rest of the committee on on the different uh, items and issues. Um, I guess the only thing that I would add to this list is, uh, and I know that. Um, We've talked previously about curriculum, uh, sort of math curriculum work that's going on. Um, you know, we had a conversation at the regional level. Um, we've also had uh, basic conversations at, at the district, you know, the Amherst School Committee uh, level. Um, I think that we really need to um, pay very special attention to what's happening among, um, especially among our Latino population, but I think just more broadly. Uh, to make sure that we are uh, not um, widening the gap that currently exists. And so what I would hope is that in the upcoming year, in addition to all these other topics, that we can also have a substantive conversation um, on how we're doing to help close that achievement gap that we see emerging in middle school and then uh, continuing all the way through high school, but that we know starts in the elementary school level. Um, and I think, honestly, you know, uh, Dr. Morris, your comments earlier about being present and spending more time in the classroom will be such a welcome, uh, you know, piece of this, right? To, to have your thoughts and your focused attention on how you see instruction um, across the district. And I know you already spend a lot of time in the schools, but I think with this particular piece, working very closely with uh, your director of curricula, you know, and, uh, and others in the district to help address this issue and then bringing that to the committee would, would really go a long way in, in um, reinforcing faith in, you know, in the work that's going on in our schools. Um, so I think, uh, unless there's anything that, that you would like to add, Dr. Morris, on that, um, or any comments or reflections? No, okay. I mean, other than to say that that list aligns, you know, um, I couldn't have written it, but aligns, I think, with what priorities are, and it's really helpful to have this in advance so that when Chair and I do some summer planning and can map out things for the fall, this is, you know, this makes logical sense and is really a continuation of ongoing work that we're doing. Um, I mean, there are new pieces in it, but I think some of it is really connected to, like, the math, what Mr. Donish has talked about. You know, we've been talking about that, and then what does that look like, and what's the feedback loop that school committee and the community get? Yep. Um, so um, it all makes sense to me. Great, great. Okay, so uh, last time on the agenda is accepting gifts, and we do have some gifts. If somebody would like to uh, make a motion and read them, hopefully. Ms. McDonald? I move to accept the following gifts um, from Judith New. Newcomb number 1393 to support Crocker Farm at principal discretion in the amount of $500. From Martha Ulver, number 995463 to, to support the Crocker Farm at a principal discretion in the amount of $10. And another gift from Martha Ulver, number 995510 to support Crocker Farm at the principal discretion in the amount of $10. And from UMass 5 Credit Union to support Great Changers Project Grade 3 Student Activities in the amount of $250 for a total of $770. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Uh, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. 
Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Dr. Morris? So I alluded to this at the beginning, but I want to acknowledge that Judith Newcomb, Judy Newcomb, is a longtime educator who retired on Friday from uh, years of service both at Wildwood School and at Crocker Farm School. She was an early childhood educator, worked in uh, last, most of her time in this district was at kindergarten. And just how um, touched Mr. Shea was, because we talked about this this morning, uh, to receive that gift um, and as one token of uh, how she's given back to her community. And so I just wanted to make a, a public note of appreciation for Ms. Newcomb and her work. Thank you. That's great. Great. Uh, so with that, uh, all those in favor? All right. Thank you. It's unanimous. Okay, uh, well, so we have our marching orders for the upcoming year. We've got our list of meetings. Uh, if the committee uh, would like to bring any additional items uh, to my attention or to superintendents, please feel free to do so. Um, but with that, I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful summer break. We will reconvene uh, in August 20th, it looks like, according to this schedule. So, uh, Mr. Nakajima, did you want to? Move to adjourn. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. McDonald, uh, all those in favor? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.